in the best way forward. I say to the House that I will do everything I can to help ensure that all members feel confident that we have an effective and fair system, and that those who follow our proceedings feel the same. I granted this debate today because I thought it was essential to sort out the mess we're in. We can start to do that today, but it requires two things for us all to tone down the party political sniping and focus calmly on making sure the system is effective as it can be, and for everyone to recognise that if we're going to achieve progress, we'll only do so on a cross party basis. I also want to remind the House that it is not in order to make allegations of impropriety against other named members, unless the House is considering a substantive motion dealing with the issue directly. There are other routes for raising such claims, so please use the routes that are available. I sincerely hope that all members are going to take this approach and I have recommended that by the end of this debate we have a clearer sense of how we can move forward together on this important subject. So please, let's see the House at its best, as we have certainly seen it as its worst. So, we now come to the emergency debate on the matter of the consequences of the decision of the House of the 3rd of November relating to standards. I now call Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I beg to move that this House has considered the matter of the consequences of the decision of this House on the 3rd of November relating to standards. Firstly, I would like to place on the record my thanks to you, Mr Speaker, for facilitating this debate. And I would also like to put on record my thanks for the work done by all members of staff in this place. I must agree with you, Mr Speaker. I was horrified to learn that the Commissioner for Standards has received death threats. That is appalling. Mr Speaker, no one should receive death threats for doing their job. The role of Commissioner for Standards was one of the key ways that we moved beyond previous scandals which had rocked this House. The role is not political. The Commissioner was appointed by this House to do a job, and that is what she has done and continues to do. Mr Speaker, the actions of the Government last week have tarnished this House's reputation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Last week was UK Parliament Week, a time focused on engaging citizens in the work that we do here. Well, Mr Speaker, if I had been tuning into Parliament last week for the first time, I'd probably have turned the television right back off again. Mm -hmm. I've only been a member of this place for less than two years, and most of the time I'm proud to have been chosen to represent North East Fife, to be able to act for my constituents and to fight their corner. And I was proud to do the right thing last week by opposing the government and by voting to uphold the standards procedure. It is hard to be proud to be a Member of Parliament when, as a body, we are all tarnished with the government's brush, when, in the eyes of the public, we are tainted by allegations of sleaze. The government's actions last Wednesday have rightly been condemned across the board. Sir John Major said, the way the government handled that was shameful, wrong and unworthy of this or indeed any government. Yeah. Lord Evans, Chair of the Committee on Standards in Public Life, said that the proposed reforms to the Standards Committee were deeply at odds with the best traditions of British democracy. Yeah. My inbox, and I'm sure others, are full. To give just one example of many, what gives the government the right to have a vote to change the process just because it has adversely affected one of their own? This is an appalling message to send to the wider public. And I think my constituent is right. What gives this government a right to think that it can change the rules when the decision doesn't suit them? That it can ignore judgments if they are not in its favour? And that can it whip its own MPs to achieve the outcome it wanted in violation of the conventions of this House? Happy to give way to the Honourable Member. I'm very grateful for her giving way. Would she agree with me that the other thing that this did was distract from potentially what is the most important 
set of debates going on at the moment, which is COP26. And when our constituents were tuning into this place, that is what the focus of Parliament should have been. But instead, it was on the shenanigans of this government, and that's the real tragedy here. Thank the Honourable Member for intervention. I entirely agree. COP is the last chance saloon for this country, for the planet, and to have distractions in this place is reprehensible. On that point. I'll give away. I am extremely grateful to the Honourable Lady for having secured today's debate on standards. And because when I was first elected to this House, the mother of all parliaments, I was incredibly proud because I thought that members conducted themselves with honour and integrity, that we were not ruled by a Prime Minister uh, who was a tin pot dictator and who is himself is now mired in sleaze. Oh, oh, order, order. We've just said we want to show the House that it's best. Tim Pop dictator aimed at an individual, I don't think he's going to bring humans in. I want to see us at our best that shows that we take this seriously. We want to put the House in the best place forward. So please, moderate language, moderate thoughts. Let's do this right. Wendy Chamberlain. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. But I do think there's a point here. This is almost the kind of behaviour we would expect to see in the Duma in Moscow, the National People's Congress in Beijing, not in the House of Commons. Now, previous Prime Ministers and previous governments have all had their failings, but it's a long time since we have seen these issues and the absolute lack of resolve to do anything about it. They say a fish rots from the head down. And I'm disappointed to see that the Prime Minister has chosen not to turn up today to answer questions, given that the leader of the opposition is in his place. You can't help but feel that he thinks the rules don't apply to him. The government has recently failed to properly investigate allegations, failed to declare relevant meetings and arguably attempt to rig the system to cover their own backs. This is a Prime Minister who flew to Afghanistan to escape a vote on Heathrow when he was Foreign Secretary and has driven to the North East to escape questions uh, today. Run, Boris, run. I have had correspondence. <laughs> I'll give way to the Honourable Member. Thank, I thank the Honourable Member for giving way and for securing this debate. As one of those who voted against their government uh, or, or defied their government, the Three Line Whip, last week on this issue, I think she will agree that it was painfully wrong to try and reform a system at this point. We've had years to reform it. But does she agree that we need cross-party support going forward? Yes. And given that the Committee on Standards is already looking at this issue, we should wait for their findings before making any decisions about going forward. I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention, and I'm sure he was present at the debate last week, which was exactly what this side of the House was calling for. It was calling for consensus, it was calling for the goalposts not to be moved, and it was calling for us to, on an ongoing basis, as we should be doing, look at our processes and procedures and hold ourselves to account, as our voters expect us to do. I have had correspondence from lifelong Conservative voters who have been appalled, not just at last week's actions, but sadly, the last two years of actions by this government and the alarming frequency by which scandals befall them. I'll give way. I, I thank the Honourable yeah, yeah. Member for, for giving way. And does she uh, agree with me that the government has been playing a ridiculous game with the public's trust, not only by the foul play in last week's vote, but also by a string of corrupt dealings over the past two years? Yeah. 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 I thank the Honourable Member for her intervention. Um, I will go on to detail some of the things she's referring to. Uh, back in May 2020, Dominic Cummings' trip to Barnard Castle in fragrant bleach of COVID regulations. Then it was the Home Secretary found to have breached the Ministerial Code, but let off. And then the then Health Secretary breaking COVID guidance he had been instructing others to follow. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. I haven't. Yeah, I'll give way. It has been said in the media that some MPs are now walking through the corridors of Westminster feeling invincible. Does she agree with me that we are accountable to our constituents and they are our boss? I thank the Honourable Member for the intervention. I agree that is one of the challenges in terms of this is not an ordinary job. We are not uh, in a line management structure. We are accountable only to our constituents. Just on that point, yes. can I make, as the longest serving um, benches, can I say to the House, I was appalled at what happened last week, but can I say, as a long serving member, it isn't typical of the behaviour 
I have worked with people in this House on all parties for a very long time, and most of the behaviour is good. It's excellent. It's cross-party. So this has really uh, done something to damage our reputation. But to please don't any of us undermine the fact that normally most of our members on all sides act honourably, work together, and I'm proud to be a member working with them. I thank the Honourable Member for his intervention. As an MP elected in 2019, one of the things that has been a great loss as a result of COVID has been the opportunity to meet people in real life and actually engage across the House, across parties. And, uh, and I'm hoping that as we move through COVID, there's more opportunity to do that so that we can see the good behaviour on all sides. Yes, just briefly. My honourable friend, uh, not just for securing this debate, but um, for being um, kind and letting me uh, intervene. Absolutely right. In, in recent weeks, we have mourned the loss of two great men who served their communities well in this House and were decent people. And we've talked about how important it is that we conduct ourselves with grace and forgiveness on all sides, that our tone should be different to that which the public expect. But she also agreed with me that being gracious does not mean ignoring the reality when one side behaves especially badly. We do not need to be soppily neutral. The reality is the government made a decision last week to do something which undermines trust in democracy at every level, locally and here, and that is why her debate is so important. Thank the member for his intervention. We are the opposition on this bench. It is our job to oppose the government unless it can demonstrate it otherwise. I'm going to try and make some progress. Over the last 20 months, my constituents have had to follow more rules than they have ever had to deal with before. While we are sadly governed by ministers who seem to care far less about the rules than any predecessors in living memory, which is why we are here today. Uh, ministers who, arguably, it has been reported over the weekend, are focused on pleasing their boss, not on doing what is right for this country. We have seen story after story break. Cash for honours, undeclared interests. On that point, very briefly. Um, I, th I thank my honourable friend. On that point of cash for honours, would she agree with me that the House of Lords Appointments Committee should be put on a statutory footing? This would uh, make sure that any recommendations made to the Prime Minister could not be ignored, in the same way the Prime Minister ignored advice given to him by the previous independent adviser on ministerial interests when they recommended that the Home Secretary be sacked for bullying. Yeah. Um, I thank the Honourable Member for intervention. I think these are things that need to all be looked at on an ongoing basis, and there are potentially areas where the different processes are in conflict with one another. But I will now make pro uh, progress. Who is influencing our politics? How is taxpayers' money being spent? And what is being done to hold those in power to account? And that's why we argue that we do need a public inquiry with the powers and resources to get to the depths of the situation we are in. People around the country who play by the rules deserve answers, and instead they are being let down by a Prime Minister and a government who um, won't even take the most basic of steps to turn up to this debate. And it is a great shame that the Prime Minister hasn't graced us with his presence this afternoon, because there is still a huge amount that we do not know about the events of last week. And there are many questions uh, that demand answers, and many of those involve the Prime Minister's personal role in this affair. A Prime Minister who has been under investigation more times than any other member in recent years. And the question is, Mr Speaker, um, who stands to benefit from getting the current standards processes out of the way? And members of the public will have to draw their own conclusions of that, with the Prime Minister not being here today. But the questions don't stop at the Prime Minister. They do extend to those involved in the whipping operation last week. Firstly, why was there a whipping operation in the first place? No. This was house was it, business. Was it? No. it should not have been whipped. How did it go? The government tried to change our procedures without our consent, and then it U turned and tried to walk it back. But you can't walk back the events of last week. That's why we're here looking forward. We've heard serious concerning allegations today that members breaking the whip were threatened with a removal of funding for projects in their constituency, and I'd ask uh, the Cabinet Secretary to address this and whether it's true. This matter deserves further investigation. The idea is that communities should suffer because their representative did the right thing. 
Greeks is frankly abhorrent. And even despite all those alleged threats, the whipping operation was only a partial success. And I do thank those members on the opposite benches who stood up for what was right, and those members, including the Father of the House, who supported my application last week. I will give way to the Honourable Member. If you are giving way, I would just like to make it clear that at no stage were any threats of that nature made to me when I broke the whip last week. Thank the Honourable Member for his intervention and for providing us with that clarity. It is unfortunate the Prime Minister is not here to do that. Um, but the final set of questions, Mr Speaker, are for us in this place to answer. Not ministers, not the government, but members of this House. How do we go about rebuilding trust and confidence in what we do here? I hope we will be able I'm not going to, I'm going to make progress. I hope we'll be able to discuss this further today. Mr Speaker, no system is perfect. There is always room for improvement. Certainly, when I previously thought about our process for investigating complaints against members, what I saw last week made abundantly clear that changes do need to be made. I do find it quite hard to believe that Owen Patterson was able to vote on his own suspension last week, whilst the votes of members currently under investigation were actually critical in the passage of the amendment which saved him. It does look that the equivalent of defendants in a court case also taking part in the jury. And it is wrong, and if we are to make changes, I would argue that must be top of the list of reforms. There has been much discussion of a right to appeal, something we have heard a lot from the government as they try to justify their actions. But I would point out that through the Borders Bill currently going through Parliament, the government is attempting to take the rights of appeal away from asylum seekers. Mr Speaker, no matter what changes are proposed, one thing is clear. Those with a vested interest in tearing up Parliament's anti sleaze rules should not be given the power to do so. And any amendment to these rules must be done fairly and with proper time and consideration by this House. It is this House which invests the authority in the Standards Committee to act on its behalf in considering the Commissioner's reports and considering whether or not to uphold those reports and the sanctions attached to them. And I'm sure that the right honourable member for Rhonda and chair of the Standards Committee will use time today to speak about the steps which the Standards Committee is taking and which you referred to uh, earlier, Mr Speaker. As a new MP elected in 2019, I didn't vote on the current rules, but I accept them because they are the rules in place. I'm a member of a smaller party. We do not have representation on the Standards Committee, but those are the rules and we accept them. If the processes are to be changed, that needs to be done properly and with consensus across the House. That is what the Leader of the House should be looking to do, have been looking to do last Wednesday, to act on behalf of the House instead of his own party. It is what he should be doing today, listening to members' contributions and responding to them, and I understand he is not doing so. I, instead, we have the Minister for the Cabinet Office responding to us. So, Can he let us know what exact involvement the Cabinet Office has in this House's standards procedures? Certainly, wherever we go from here, without a cross-party consensus, reforms will simply have no legitimacy. Mr Speaker, like you, I hope for positive and constructive contributions from all sides of the House this afternoon as we work out how to move forward from the scandal. And I hope that the Leader of the House and the Prime Minister will engage with this process. In closing, Mr Speaker, one of my other constituents wrote to me saying, Mr Patterson's resignation is not the end. It must be the beginning of an uncompromising campaign to end the corruption of our politics. Yeah. I hope that we can bring, begin that campaign in this place today. Yeah. The question is us on the order paper. I call Minister Bartley. Secretary Bartley. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Order. Those who are shouting were as the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister phoned me along with the leader of the SNP this morning to say neither of them could be with us. So they have given their reasons, whether it's right, wrong, or different. I don't make judgments, but I can only say on behalf of both of the two people concerned, both leaders, one is at COP and the other is visiting hospitals in the North East. So that's where the Prime Minister is. So I don't need to hear all the way through where is he. I've explained it. Now you can make your own decisions. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am grateful to the Honourable Member for North East Fife for securing and opening this debate. The Government has been listening carefully to the legitimate concerns raised by Honourable and Right Honourable Members on all sides of the House, both during and since last Wednesday's debate. These are vitally important matters to you, Mr Speaker, and to the whole House. 
But before I set out the Government's position today, I would like first and foremost to express my regret and that of my ministerial colleagues over the mistake made last week. We recognise that there are concerns across the House over the standards system and also the process by which possible breaches of the Code of Conduct are investigated. Well, in a minute. Yet, while sincerely held concerns clearly warrant further attention, the manner in which the Government approached last week's debate conflated them with the response to an individual case. This House shares a collective interest in ensuring that the Code of Conduct reflects and fosters the highest standards of public life. The Government fully recognises that the Standards Committee is critical to this, including the important role performed by its Chairman, the Honourable Member for the Rhonda. Of course, I give. Very grateful for him giving away. He's already offered one apology. Can I ask him to give another? And that is to residents who live in constituencies that have MPs that his front bench and whips were threatening to withdraw spending in their community just to punish them for, th for, for thinking about voting for, uh, the, not voting for the amendment last week. Could he apologise to those residents? They are innocent bystanders, and it's not their fault that they could have money taken out of their community simply because of something that their MP does on a matter of conscience. I, I fear, Mr Speaker, he prepared that intervention before hearing from my uh, honourable friend, who just said that, despite voting against the government, uh, that was a misrepresentation of the conversations. I of course, I give way to the Mother of the House. I thank the, I thank the right honourable gentleman for giving way. Could he um, explain why he is doing this debate mm. yeah. and not the Leader of the House, mm. whose job it is yeah. to deal with the yeah. issue of yeah. the standards yeah. decision? Yeah. Isn't this yeah. adding insult to injury and yeah. showing the yeah. government yeah. just yeah. really yeah. doesn't understand it? Yeah. 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 With first of all, my right to my friend, the Leader of the House is here in the chamber <laughs> with me. Uh, and secondly, as she well knows, as she well knows, not least as the mother of the House, that the Cabinet Office uh, oversees the government response across departments, including on a number of the issues uh, covered uh, by this issue. Of course, I give way one further time, then I'll make progress. I'm, I'm grateful for uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman giving way, and I also appreciate his apology on behalf of uh, the government, and I'm sure other members will do. But can he give the House a commitment? that for the future disciplinary matters, they're matters for the House and yeah, not for yeah. the Government. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, as has been set out by the Prime Minister and by other colleagues in Government, we are committed to working on a cross-party basis, including with the Chair uh, of uh, the Standards Committee. And uh, it is for that reason, I'll uh, just make some progress, that reason, as I say, I recognise the important role performed by the Chairman. Uh, and I just picked that out in terms of my remarks. We thank him, Mr Speaker, and indeed the committee's lay members for their service, as we do the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards as well. And I want to reiterate the Government has previously taken and will continue to take a cross-party approach to issues around standards in this House. Of course, I agree. I, I'm very grateful. I too, like my honourable friend, the member for Newcastle and the Lyme, um, received no pressure whatsoever in terms of the way I voted last week. Um, does my right to my friend, who set out a very gracious apology in terms of what happened last week, but um, would he concede that one of the things I think that wasn't right with the amendment that I think the government supported was hand-picking the members of that committee? Would not, it not be better if the standards of this House are going to be reformed is that the committee should be chaired by somebody who is elected by this whole House and that the members of the committee are also elected in a normal way as select committee members. Well, Mr Speaker, as I just set out, we are committed to working on a cross-party uh, basis and we regret that many honourable members did not feel that they had been sufficiently consulted uh, on the proposals last week. But I, I simply refer to the article in The Times by the Chair of the Standards Committee, who said, and I quote, I'm sure we need to review both the Code of Conduct and the way it operates, and further went on to say, Mr Speaker, that there are good arguments in favour of a more formal additional process 
whereby a member could appeal against the sanction either to an outside body or to a subcommittee or the standards committee. It was to that that the debate turned uh, last week, but of course I go away to the Honourable Lady. I, I, I thank uh, the um, uh, Cabinet Secretary for giving way. Last week was UK Parliament Week, but it was not our finest hour. Does, does the Secretary of State uh, for the Cabinet Office agree with me that, at the very least, a message from this debate must be that we work in our constituents' interests and in the public interest, and that the use of this House to work in private interest to the tune of hundreds of thousands of pounds will not be tolerated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as I said, and of course I hadn't seen that the Chair was, was seeking to grab my attention, so of course I'll give way. But we are committed, Mr Speaker, to working on a cross-party basis, and with that in mind, of course, I will give way to I, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful, and I acknowledge um, the apology that the Minister has given on, on behalf of the Government. But I do want to... We are still in a bit of a hole, the whole of Parliament. Um, we still have a motion that was carried last week, um, which leaves the question of Mr Patterson's conduct um, hanging in the air. Um, I gave earlier today a um, draft of a motion which could be considered by the House tomorrow if the Government were to table it tonight, and I think it would have the support of the whole House in uh, clearing up the fact, as you, Mr Speaker, referred to, that we haven't actually decided whether Mr Patterson's behaviour was inappropriate. I think the whole House now accepts that it was. And secondly, we've created a committee which, which I think even the honourable member who's meant to be chairing it doesn't want to be on anymore. <laughs> um, so it would be quite a good idea if we could clear this up tomorrow before we yeah, go into recess. Yeah, and I hope yeah. he will say now that he's going to table that motion later on today. Yeah. Well, I've been very clear, Mr Speaker, that we will listen to the House and we will listen to the debate. Well, if the Honourable Lady will just let me answer the, chair, the Chair's uh, point. Mr Patterson has now resigned, so it would not be possible for the House to endorse a sanction of suspension. And I simply remind the House that he suffered a serious personal tragedy. He has now resigned. In his statement, he said he wants to continue outside of public life uh, in terms of uh, politics. Uh, and therefore, I think... We should respect that, and I hope through your office, Mr Speaker, there will be a way for us to engage on a cross-party basis, and that is what the Government will now redouble its efforts to engage on uh, in the days ahead. I'll give one further time there, and then to the Honourable Lady. Very grateful to the Minister for giving way, and there isn't anybody in this House who doesn't have the utmost sympathy for Mr Patterson's uh, plight. But I think we do have to also remember that he did say that he would re do exactly the same if the opportunity presented. Mm. I'm grateful that the Minister has rendered his apology, but does he not think it more appropriate that the Prime Minister attends and gives his apology? And if I can assist the Speaker, rather than being in the northeast of England, defending the conduct of his police and crime commissioners, yeah. one who's had to resign over inappropriate remarks and another one who is under investigation. Yeah. Well, we respect, I think Mr Speaker dealt with that uh, at the opening uh, of this debate and made clear both the Prime Minister and the leader uh, of the SNP had discussed with the, Mr Speaker in terms of the debate today. Uh, I'll give way to the Honourable Can I just say... Thank you, sir. Um, I abstained last week, and I thank the government absolutely for the apology, which is completely the right thing to do. And I would also like to say on record that despite the fact that I've abstained, and I occasionally have the misfortune to vote against this government, the government continues to be nothing but supportive of both myself and the people of the Isle of Wight. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Speaker, and I think it's helpful uh, to get that on the record. Uh, I'll just make some progress. Uh, the Government will now redouble its efforts to engage on a cross-party basis, uh, and indeed with you, uh, Mr Speaker, in the days ahead, because we know what we can achieve when we do so. For example, in collaboration with others, my right honourable friend, the Member for South Northamptonshire, worked hard when Leader of the House to establish the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, the ICGS. This scheme to which the government is wholly in a moment. This scheme to which the government is wholly committed is a model that I believe has many strengths. It includes an appeals process and ability to adjudicate complex cases by virtue of its independent expert panel led 
by a High Court judge. Overall, the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme brings with it the expectation of rigour, impartiality and fairness for both the complainant and respondent. I will give way to the Honourable I am grateful to my right hand for giving way. It would be, I think, of enormous help to the House if we could understand the Government's thinking on this issue, which the Honourable Gentleman from Rhonda alluded to. The amended motion last week was passed. I voted against it, but it was passed. What is its status now? There seems to be a general consensus that the rules that we deploy uh, in, with regards to standards are reviewed. Are they to be reviewed under the current auspices or under the auspices of the amended motion last week of some shadow or secondary standards committee looking at it? If we could know that, that we are going to work through the actual procedures which are in existence today and effectively expunge the amended motion from the record of last week, that I think the House would find helpful. Well, Mr Speaker, it's clear that the committee agreed by the House last week will not be able to develop proposals without cross-party participation. And that is why, therefore, we're continuing discussions and listening to views across the House about the best way forward. I give way to the Honourable Gentleman. Uh, thank you to the uh, Minister for giving way. And in an attempt to help the Government, isn't the root cause isn't the root cause of all of this MPs trying to get paid more, even more, than the £82,000 per year that MPs already get? But I shouldn't have to remind the Government that 95% of the public get paid less than MPs. And I shouldn't have to remind the Government that being an MP is a full-time job. Chasing corporate cash is quite simply shortchanging the public. So will the Minister agree to help clean up politics by backing my bill to ban second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh jobs for members of Parliament. Secretary Barfley. Uh, well, I'm not sure, Mr Speaker, whether all on his own benches uh, would support that, because there is value in MPs having a continued connection with the world outside of politics, and banning all second jobs would have captured some in this House, for example, who work uh, as doctors or nurses and have supported the NHS through the pandemic. And I would argue, uh, Mr Speaker, that it makes sense to build on the recent work of the member for, for Northampton South and the uh, procedure that she developed when Leader of the House. Uh, and, Mr Speaker, we share a commitment to a system which encourages and communicates the right values, attitudes and behaviour in a moment, making clear to members that in performing their parliamentary duties, they are expected always to act in the public interest with courtesy, professionalism and respect. I'll take one further intervention. I'm grateful to the State for, for giving way, and I'm grateful to him for his apology for as, as far as it went. But last week it was quite clear that the Government did not agree with the Standards Committee's recommendations in their report. So I'm not clear today. Is the Government saying that they now agree that Owen oh, oh, Patterson behaved badly? And incorrectly, or are they just saying apologising today for the process that they imposed on us last week? What I'm saying, Mr. Speaker, is Mr. Patterson has uh, left Parliament. He has resigned, and therefore uh, suspending him from the House would no longer be applicable. But it is the work of every member to safeguard Parliament's reputation by upholding its principles and abiding by its rules. Moving ahead, our shared responsibility is to identify and seize opportunities to improve the system, to ensure that it is robust and fair, that it commands the confidence of members and our constituents, and that it is aligned with the fundamental principles of natural justice. To that end, Mr Speaker, I welcome forthcoming contributions from colleagues. I can assure you that the Government will be listening carefully to the insights and views of members from across the House. Keir Starmer, Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I, I see the Leader of the House is in the House, uh, so it is a surprise to see the Minister for the Cabinet Office at the dispatch box today. Mr Speaker, he and I have faced each other across the dispatch box many times. And it's always a pleasure 
but I'm sure he, like me, wishes that his days as the night watchman were a thing of the past, <laughs> defending valiantly against hostile bowling on a sticky wicket of his Prime Minister's creation. It's as if 2019 never ended. <laughs> Mr Speaker, that is because last week the Prime Minister damaged himself, and despite the bravery of some members opposite, he damaged his party, but most importantly, he damaged our democracy. We are fortunate in this country. Voters may not always agree with politicians, they often don't, but they do trust that disagreements are sincere that their representatives are acting in the way that they think is in the public interest, and that we can resolve our disagreements in debate and at the ballot box. But when the Prime Minister gives the green light to corruption, he corrodes that trust. When he says that the rules to stop vested interests don't apply to his friends, he corrodes that trust and when he deliberately undermines those charged with stopping corruption, he corrodes that yeah. trust. Yeah. And that is exactly what the Prime Minister did last week. And now today, he does not even have the decency to come here either to defend what he did or to apologise for his actions. Yeah. Where is he? Rather than repairing the damage that he's done, the Prime Minister is running scared. Yeah. When required to lead, he's chosen to hide. Yeah. Yeah. His concern, as always, is self-preservation, yeah. not yeah. the national interest. Yeah. And it's time for everyone in this House, whatever their party, to draw a line and to send a message to the Prime Minister, enough is enough, yep. we will not stand by while he trashes our democracy. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the case of the former member for North Rockshire is simple. Everyone in this House has enormous sympathy for the tragic circumstances in which he lost his wife. Yeah. His pain and his anguish are unimaginable. And I wish to express my condolences to him, as I did at the time. The Committee on Standards rightly took those awful circumstances into account when considering his conduct. There was a serious and robust process. He had prior notice of the charges against him. He had legal advisers with him. He was invited to appeal against the Commissioner's finding in writing and in person, and he did so. The findings were clear, an egregious case of paid advocacy. He took money to lobby ministers. That is against the rules, as it is in any functioning democracy, and it's corrupt. The Prime Minister should have told the former member for North Shropshire that the right thing to do was to accept his punishment. Yeah. Yeah. His duty of care demanded that he do that. Yes, absolutely. His duty to defend standards demanded that he do that. Yeah. Basic decency demanded absolutely. that he do that. Instead, the British people were let down, and the former member for North Shropshire was let down, used as a pawn in an extraordinary attack on our Commissioner for Standards. Threats to have money taken away from schools, hospitals and high streets unless members voted to undermine the Commissioner. Ministers sent out on the airways the morning after the vote to call for her to reconsider and consider her position. And a sham committee proposed so the government can set the judge and jury for future cases. This was a deliberate course of action, but the government was caught off guard 
by the public outcry and they've climbed down. But Mr Speaker, this wasn't a tactical mistake, an innocent misjudgment swiftly corrected by a U-turn. It was the Prime Minister's way of doing business, a pattern of behaviour. When the Prime Minister's visor on the Ministerial Code found against the Home Secretary, the Prime Minister kept the Home Secretary and forced out the adviser. When the Electoral Commission investigated the Conservative Party, the Prime Minister threatened to shut it down. And when the Commissioner for Standards looked into the Prime Minister's donations, the Prime Minister tried to take her down. Government corruption, there is no other word for it. And Mr Speaker, I will in just one moment. And Mr Speaker, it's said that the Prime Minister doesn't believe the rules apply to him. But it's worse than that. He absolutely knows that the rules do apply to him. His strategy is to devalue the rules so they don't matter to anyone anymore and to go over, go after those charged with enforcing the rules so that breaking the rules has less consequence. That way, politics becomes contaminated. Cynicism replaces confidence and trust. The taunt that politicians are all in it for themselves becomes accepted wisdom. And with that, the Prime Minister hopes to drag us all into the gutter with him. No way. It only serves to convince people that things can't get better, that government can't improve people's lives. Progress isn't possible because politics doesn't work. But in the right hands, used in the right way, for the right reasons, politics can work because politics can be a noble cause to build a better country, to build a better world. And for some, it is also a great personal sacrifice. The plaques in this House to Airy Neve and to Joe Cox, the empty seat where just weeks ago Sir David Amos sat, are testament to that price. If we're to honour their memory, we have to defeat the politics of cynicism propagated by this Prime Minister. I will give way. I'm grateful to the Leader of the Opposition for giving way. One of the rules that we've always observed in this place is that you don't whip house business. Yeah. And just about everything that has happened since last week can be traced back to the determination of the government to whip that. Does he share my concern that we've heard nothing from the Treasury bench today, that if we on this side of the House participate in future exploration of the rules, that when they return to this House, there will be no repetition of whipping the votes, either for or against them. And indeed, without that undertaking, it would be very difficult for anyone on this side to accept that what we hear from the Treasury bench is a good faith exercise. Well, I do share that concern. It would be a very easy thing for the government to say today, and we've got another two hours to run in this debate, so there's plenty of time to say it. I will. I couldn't agree more with the opposition that house business should never be whipped. I just wondered if the Leader of Opposition could say whether he whipped his members yeah. last week. Yeah. Oh, of course not. <laughs> no. <laughs> we didn't. Our members didn't need whipping yeah. to know what the right decision was. Mr Speaker, there are good ideas across the, the House about how we can improve standards to restore the trust the Prime Minister has broken. We are willing. There's been talk this afternoon about cross-party working. We are willing to work cross-party and with the expertise of the Standards Committee to make that happen. But let me be loud and clear. We are not willing to work with the Government on their plans to weaken standards. There will be no cross-party agreement on weakening standards. There are other ideas. Labour's long called for the MP's Code of Conduct to ban paid directorships and consultancy roles. 
The current Code of Conduct recognises that those roles are a potential conflict of interest, but it does not ban them. We voted to fix that in 2015, but we were blocked by the Government. A change along those lines has been recommended by the Independent Committee on Standards in Public Life, but there has not been any action from the Government. It is time to put that right. Mr Speaker, in addition, the revolving door between ministerial office and the private sector is in full swing. Ministers can still regulate a company one minute and then work for them the next. The Business Appointments Committee is too weak to provide the check and the balance, and it is time to shut the revolving door by banning these job swaps. I will in just one second, if you will give, uh, give me a moment. In addition, this weekend we have been reminded of that appalling, inevitable pattern. Large donation to the Conservative Party, a stint as party treasurer, mm -hmm. and then an appointment to the House of Lords. <laughs> the regulator has been ignored by the Prime Minister and broken in the process. There is no doubt the House of Lords needs fundamental democratic reform, but we can act now to toughen the rules over appointments. I did say I'd give way. I'm most grateful to the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, he was, of course, a former Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, and I'm also aware that in 2003, under a Labour government, uh, with the Committee for Standards set up the investigatory panel with rules of natural justice contained in it, if it were to be implemented, which in this case it was not. Would he, as a former Director of Public Prosecutions, agree that the rules of natural justice could be avoided where an investigatory panel could have been set up but was not? Yeah. Well, I understand the point, but let's just just remind ourselves of the process here. The independent commissioner examines the complaint and comes to a finding. There is then, uh, and the charge is known, and the individual can be legally represented and advised. And I understand the former member from North Shropshire was legally advised throughout the process. The finding of the commissioner can then be appealed to the committee. That committee can either agree with the Commissioner or disagree. And I'll be correct if I'm wrong. I think on occasion the committee has disagreed and therefore the appeal has been allowed um, and the individual does not face the sanction. Before that committee, the individual, and I think the former member from North Shropshire, can be legally advised. I think he had two legal teams in that process was able to make a statement setting out his case and his defence. Every point that was made in his defence last Wednesday was made by him to the committee, to, as anybody who has read the report will know. It was rejected by the committee. He was then questioned um, for a number of hours by the committee members. That is an appeal. That is due process. And can I just say this? For millions of working people up and down the country, that is a much stronger position that they, than they face if they are disciplined in their workplace. And we owe it to them to recommend it. I'll just make some progress. On all of these, on all of these areas where we can improve, we can work together to restore trust and strengthen standards. But instead, we have been invited into a sham process designed to force out the Commissioner for Standards. And we're told the main problem is that there wasn't a right of appeal, when there clearly is one. And that's why we have no interest in talking to the government about how to weaken the current system. Mr Speaker, the lack of common ground is fundamental. The government wants to weaken the system because the system keeps investigating and finding against them. The best solution is the simple one. They should change their behaviour. And the Prime Minister should show some leadership. He should send a clear message that the rules apply to everyone and that those enforcing the rules to prevent corruption will be supported by the government rather than forced out. Uh, I will. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank um, my friend for giving way. 
Doesn't he think, though, that the sham is even continuing today? Because not only is the Prime Minister not here, given the importance of this issue, the Leader of the House is here, which is right because it's a House issue, but is completely silent. And the Minister who's there, in his place, where the Leader of the House or the Prime Minister should be, can't even answer the basic question from either side of the House about how we proceed now and whether they'll accept the recommendation from Chair of Standards Committee. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you for the uh, intervention. I couldn't agree more. The Prime Minister should be here. Leadership is about taking responsibility. Yeah. And if there's an apology to be made, that apology should come from the top, just as the direction came from the top last week to engage in this business in the first place. The, I, I'll just make some progress and, and, and then I'll, I, I will give way. The Prime Minister could start by making three simple commitments. First, Work with us to ensure that the member for Delin faces a recall petition. Yeah. It is completely unacceptable for a member to be found guilty of sexually harassing junior staff, yet avoid the judgment of the electorate on the basis of a loophole. Absolutely. The government has hidden behind that loophole. It's now time to come out of hiding. Yeah. Secondly, the Prime Minister needs to agree that no member found guilty of egregious breaches of the MP's Code of Conduct can be recommended for a peerage. Yeah. The Government can't reward bad behaviour and corruption with a job for life making the laws of the land. Yeah. And third, the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister must commit to a full and transparent investigation into Randocks and the government contracts. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mr Speaker, what do we know? We know that Randolph's has been awarded government contracts worth over £600 million without comp uh, competition or tender. Yeah. Okay. We know that the former member for North Shropshire lobbied for Randolph's. Yeah. Yeah. We also know that he sat in on a call between Randolph's and the minister responsible for handling the health contracts. Against that backdrop, there is obviously a concern that the use of taxpayers' money and the effectiveness of our pandemic response may have been influenced by paid advocacy from the former member from North Shropshire. So if the Prime Minister is interested in rooting out corruption, he needs to launch a full investigation. If the Prime Minister is interested in restoring trust, we need full transparency with all the relevant correspondence published, no ifs and no buts. Mr Speaker, last week the Prime Minister damaged himself, he damaged his party and he damaged our democracy. He led his party through the sewers and the stench lingers. This week he had the chance to clean up to apologise to the country and finally accept that the rules apply to him and his friends. But instead of stepping up, he's hidden away. Instead of clearing up his mess, he's left his side knee-deep in it. Instead of leading from the front, he's cowered away. He is not a serious leader, and the joke isn't funny anymore. Thank you, Mr. Come to part of the House of Peter Bottomley. Mr Speaker, it would be tempting to each of us on all sides of the House to get into a mud bath and start throwing things at each other. We can go back in time. I've got a little list as well, but I don't think this is the right time. And I'd like to congratulate the Honourable Lady from North East Fife for her requesting this debate. I'd like to thank my Honourable Friend for Wellingborough for saying yes, last week he thought we ought to have this. I think that there's cross-party support for what we're doing now. Uh, the only positive thing I can say to the government on this is if they think they're going to make a mistake in future, talk to me first and we can make it together. <laughs> I, I congratulate my rational friend, the Leader of the House, for acknowledging on Thursday that things had, had been done wrong and need putting right. I'm sorry to be speaking in advance of the Chair of the Standards Committee because I'd like to know what the terms of his motion are which could restore uh, the consequences of the vote we ought to have taken, or the way we ought to have taken it, on Wednesday, because it's quite clear that this House should have backed the committee. Yeah, yeah, and I think we need to find a way of showing that. And we ought to acknowledge that in future, 
whether it's a member on my side of the House or another side of the House, that people who resign from Parliament don't leave Parliament without making a decision on a firm recommendation of the Standards Committee with members of Parliament and with independent members. So I think we need to find a way of, of making that plain. My Honourable Friend, the Leader of the House, and my own friend who spoke for the Government, uh, say there's widespread support for reforming the system. I'm not part of that support. I believe the system does work, can work, and should work. I'd be interested in knowing what the Committee on Standards wants to recommend, and I'll look at that with an open mind, just because it was all right for me 20, 18 years ago when I was on the Committee with Martin Bell. doesn't mean to say it can't be improved. But I would say to the Government, as well as responding to what we ought to have done on Wednesday, which I think is the point of this debate, I'd like to hear from the Government how they're going to respond to Lord Evans' report, which came out this week, which has four and a half pages of recommendations. This afternoon is not the time to go through those, but I do think we ought to have a coherent approach which helps to ratchet up our observance of standards, our recognition of standards. And I think that the only thing I want to say, by the way, on the people who have introduced the question of whether MPs should have outside jobs besides being members of Parliament, we do have a hundred or so who are ministers, so they've got an extra job as well as being a member of Parliament. We do have those, an example I've often used is Peter Thurman, who, when made redundant, sell his own business, became a successful engineering business owner. Should he have had to give up, should Michael Foote have given up his writing or his royalties when he was here? I think we should take great care about that. But I do, I, I, I do believe that any member of Parliament who declares outside earnings should do it not just in writing, but face to face with the registrar and explain what they're doing and can be reminded what the limits are of what they do. Because the, the one thing I would say to the face of my former colleague, the right honourable member, who, who, Owen Patterson, is that the one thing we know, if we take on a consultancy with a business, is we cannot do anything which can be interpreted as lobbying or in the interest of that business. That's the only thing we can say. I'll give away once. I'm extremely grateful to the Father of the House, and I do declare small earnings as a musician outside of this uh, house, in addition to my very small. Uh, uh, but um, isn't, there, isn't there an additional point, perhaps, that ought to be part of this debate that we could add to the list, that the, the excellent list that the Leader of the Opposition put forward, and that is around public appointments? Because isn't there real concern that the government's attitude towards public appointments yeah. is straying away? from the rules as overseen by the Commissioner for Public Appointments, and in particular with the uh, forthcoming appointment of the Chair of Ofcom, yeah, yeah, where the yeah, whole yeah. process is being run, rerun, yep. truncated, yep. and quite frankly there are suspicions being tricked up to favour a particular candidate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I'm biased in favour of Paul Dacre, because he and I were working to get the killers of Stephen Lawrence convicted, charged and convicted. If I was asked if he's the right person to chair Ofcom, I'd say no, but I haven't been asked. But... <laughs> uh, Mr Speaker, many will want to speak in this debate. I re I'll try not to repeat myself. I believe the present system can work if we make it work. I think that those of us who find that others have taken a different view to the propriety of what we've done, that we ought to trust their judgment more than trust our own, and not just go on saying, I thought I was right at the time. We can each do things which are wrong. If we do, we should say so, say sorry, and try to let this House move on. That way, I think we can ratchet up the standards of our achievements as well as the standards of our behaviour. Yeah. SNP spokesperson Pete Wishart. Thank you ever so much, Mr Speaker. And always it's a privilege and pleasure to follow the Father in the House. I want to congratulate the Honourable Lady for North East Fife for securing this important debate. And I think she's introduced it in a means and a manner which is significantly different to what we had last week. And I welcome her comments on that behalf. But Mr Speaker, what a few days this has been. What a week we have had to endure as politicians who serve in this House. Our politics have been taken to a very, very dark place indeed. The sense that rules have been torn up, the feeling that we've returned to the worst days of Tory sleeves, sleeves that we thought had been buried and gone, never to return. 
There's a sense of outrage amongst the public that I've never seen in the 20 years that I've been in this place. And this is palpable and tangible into bulging email boxes with angry constituents demanding to know what on earth is going on and demanding that we put this right and sort this mess out. One has to ask, what on earth were they thinking of? What were they trying to achieve? What did they want to do? What did they think was going to happen with introducing that motion the way that they did? And I almost feel sorry for the right honourable gentleman, the Minister for the Cabinet Office. If there was a short straw for turning up to try and defend this government's action, he most certainly picked it today. And it should be his right honourable friend leading this debate. It was him that brought that grubby motion to the House last Wednesday. It was him that defended it to the hilt. It was him that took up nearly half the time that was allowed to us in order to have this debate. He should be standing at that dispatch box today, defending the government's action and telling him what he's going to do. Now, he always likes to remind me of battles of past. Can I say to him today that he's, he's like the brave Sir Robin from Monty Python and the Holy Grail, running bravely running away from doing his duty at the dispatch box? And we know that this was a plot that was hatched between the right honourable gentleman and his right honourable friend, the government chief whip, designed and approved and orchestrated through number 10 with the weight of the whipping operation that we saw last Wednesday. This is something that goes all the way to the very top. What the two of them did was to open the Tory Pandora box marked sleeves and what a grubby, rotten receptacle it's turned out to be. A government prepared to reinvent the rules if they don't like them. A government so arrogant and entitled that it believes it can get away with whatever it wants. I give way to my honourable friend. I, I thank my honourable friend for giving way. He's, he's mentioned obviously the Pandora's box of sleaze and he'll be familiar with the corruption allegations that appeared in the Sunday Times yesterday following an investigation by Open Democracy. Does he not believe, as I do, that that isn't just a matter for this House and for Parliament? For the police, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm grateful to my honourable friend because I, I do want to get round to that particular case, and I did note that yesterday. I was here for Cash for Honours Mark 1. This is Cash for Honours Mark 2.0, and I want to specifically refer to that, and I will do that in my way. remarks. I will then I'll make progress. Um, I thank the honourable yeah. member. As, as he's on this topic, does he not agree with me that another aspect? that uh, has created great anger and concern in our communities is the funding of political parties. And if we look particularly at the Russians and the way they are now currently funding the Conservative Party, with Lubov Chanukin giving £2.1 million mm -hmm. to the Conservative Party, Alexander Tomerko giving £1.3 million to the Conservative That's Party, shocking. and he's a part owner of a company that is trying to build an underwater cable, together with Viktor Fedotov, who also owns that company and who has given money to the Chancellor, to the Honourable Member for Reading West, to the Minister for Corporate Social Responsibility, to the Secretary of State for International Trade and the Chief Secretary of the Treasury. Is this right? Good. Well said. And, and it was a long intervention, but a necessary one. I think she's absolutely right and spot on. The way that donations would be going into the Tory party is something that needs to be properly investigated. And I'm going to suggest a way that that should be done in the course of my deliberations this afternoon. But, Mr Speaker, we're in day six of this. We're in six days. This has dominated political discourse in our media, in the public, and in our communities, and in our constituencies. Nobody usually survives that. No government minister who's presided and overseen something that goes on day after day after day. And the thing is, it's shown no sign of abating. It's shown no sign of going away. Now, I don't know if the public will accept the apology made by the right honourable gentleman. I suspect not. I don't think that was what the public wanted to hear. Yes, we want to hear this government standing there saying, sorry, we've got this totally wrong. But I, want to th I think the public want to hear this government being just that little bit more contrite, just that little bit more accommodating with the feelings and the sentiment that's out there in our constituency. Our constituents are angry. Our constituents are fed up. And I think the right honourable gentleman has to do a little bit better than that. I, will give to uh, uh, I, I thank him for giving way. We have already established that the corrupt and bad, bad behaviour of some MPs damage 
all of us. So what is needed now, doesn't he agree, is a commitment of every single member in this House to strengthen rather than weakening um, the, uh, the standards process and the rules around it. The Honourable Lady is absolutely right and spot on. That's exactly what is required. I mean, when I hear them talking about reforming some of the rules and regulations and some of the police things that we have in place, I'm not actually hearing an attempt to strengthen, make them better, make them more accountable. What I'm hearing from them is let's weaken them. Let's make sure that people can get off with things. We don't like them. Let's rewrite them and do them all again. That is what we're hearing from them. And can I say, I feel really sorry for honourable colleagues, honourable ladies and gentlemen up the back. They, the way that they've been treated by the front bench is almost approaching cruelty. Almost approaching cruelty. They've been marched all the way to the top of the hill by the right honourable grand old Duke of York. Then they've been marched all the way down again. But not just marched all the way down. They've been met with a barrage and volley of barbed constituent emails in the consternation of the people they represent. I feel sorry for these honourable ladies and gentlemen here today having to take that, and I hope they know who is to blame for what they have had to secure. Yes, I thank him for, for allowing this. Um, of course, this isn't the first time we've seen this Prime Minister do things that have shocked her constituents. And the last time I had a mailbag um, similar to this weekend's was the illegal prorogation of Parliament just over a couple of years ago, which um, my honourable friend took to the Supreme Court and, and exposed. That was, there was the level of outrage for that particular incident is similar to this, and they've learned nothing from it. Absolutely. I think there's a few little spikes we get in terms of interest from our constituents about <laughs> business of this place. And she's right to mention that one. That was particularly um, a, a busy, busy week for members of Parliament. Another one, of course, was Barnard Castle. I don't think we've quite reached the heights of Barnard Castle yet in terms of the response from the public, but we're getting very, very close to that. And I think that as, as this goes on and we find this unresolved, we'll be starting to get into that territory. But I listened very carefully to the Right Honourable Gentleman, and I could sense that he's not very, listening very carefully to me. But I listened very carefully to him. And I still don't know what the government's position on this is. And maybe he could help us. I don't know if there's something up today, but we need to hear from the government what they are going to do now. What I think I heard was that they're sorry for this mess. Fair enough, they're sorry for this mess. That's great. We'll accept your apology. But now tell us what you're going to do. Because the motion setting up the Kangaroo Court Committee of Corruption is still in place. That is the policy of this House. We need to hear them say clearly that they are taking this off and find some means and method to ensure that no longer is part of the business of this House. We need to hear them say that they are prepared to accept independent investigation and they will support our right honourable friend, the Chair of the Sanders Committee, and his committee in doing their work. We need to hear them say that. We also need to hear them say that they are going back to that moment just before the division bell rang last Wednesday and we go back to the situation position that we were in before any of this nonsense started. I am grateful to my honourable friend for giving way. I have a concern about his proposition because last week the, the, whether one agreed with uh, the right honourable member for South Northamptonshire's amendment, the government utilised it as a motion of confidence in themselves. Therefore, I have no confidence, I am sure he has no confidence, that any of that is going to change. Absolutely. And this is why we need clarity. And I think we have to hear this by today. I think the suggestion, I think it was from the chair of the committee, who said that we need this motion to come tomorrow so we deal effectively with the honourable member for North Shropshire. We have to have that in front of this house. And we have to be able to make sure that our judgment is passed on what we believe is the consequences of his action. And one other thing. The disgraceful attacks on the Standards Commissioner. Now, they were coordinated. There's absolutely no way that we could get around this. They, were, they, were, they came from the top. They were directed. I mean, you, you do not attack the credibility with disrespectful what things said about the Standards Commissioner if you've not got permission to do that and say that. And I think what they had in mind was a softening up exercise because they know that the Prime Minister 
is going to be investigated again. They know that there are a number of issues that still have to be resolved about his personal behaviour and conduct. And I think the undermining, undermining and neutering of the Standards Commission was a deliberate process, and it has to stop. It has to end. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Prime Minister is almost like a, a revolving door of investigation, whether it's breaking the ministerial code, acting unlawfully, soliciting degenerations for luxury holidays and home refurbishments. So the one thing that we could commit today is to this House to say that we have full faith and trust in our Standards Commissioner and we will allow her to do her job. The undermining and the disgraceful attacks on must end. But the true shocker of the past couple of days is cash for honours 2.0. I really didn't think following Tony Blair being questioned under caution by the Metropolitan Police 15 years ago, we would be back to this place so quickly. I mean, that was only in a couple of parliaments ago that Tony Blair had to face questions about donations to the House of Lords. The only difference that I've seen in the course of the past couple of decades is the price to get into the House of Lords has gone up from one million pounds from New Labour to £3 million from yeah, the Conservatives. Yeah. There's Tory inflation for you, Mr <laughs> Speaker. It now seems that nearly all the past treasurers of the Conservative Party of later, later years are in that place. Yep. They've all in that place, wearing their airmen, taking a part in the legislative decisions of this country. And they seem, the only characteristic that they seem to have, the only defining feature that seems to get them a place in that house is the fact that they're able to give several million pounds to this government. The DEFRA Secretary, the Environment Secretary, I'll just be a minute with the Honourable Gentleman. The Environment Secretary yesterday said they were in the Lords for their philanthropy. <laughs> for their philanthropy. I think the public will probably assess that the accounts of the Conservative Party is just about the worst and least deserving good cause that there is in this land. I give it more of a thing. to my honourable friend for giving me, who's making a very powerful point about this issue. Does he think it's a coincidence that the 22 largest donors to the Conservative parties now hold peerages and sit in the House of Lords? Well, that's just a coincidence. I, I don't, I have to say, because I think that place is just so corrupted that it's a receptacle for don donors of this place for either of the big parties. I don't have to include the Liberals when it comes to that too, because some of their activities around the House of Lords is just as bad as the two main parties. So what I've done today, Mr Speaker, I've asked the Metropolitan Police to investigate these appointments under the provisions of Section 1, Subsection 2 of the Honours Prevention of, of Abuses Act 1925. That Act states if any person gives or agrees or pur proposes to give or offers to any person any gift, money or valuable consideration as an inducement or reward for procuring or assisting or endeavouring to procure the grant of a dignity or title of honour to any person or otherwise in connection with such a grant shall be guilty of a misdemeanour. Yeah. I have now asked the Metropolitan Police to investigate the activities of the Conservative Party and the awarding of places in the House of Lords. And I'll say ever so gently to my friends in the Labour Party, stop putting people in that place. Stop giving it the legitimacy and credibility. We don't need a Gordon Brown Commission. We just need you guys as the opposition party to say you, you will abolish it. It is a circus. It is a corrupt circus. And it is the high point of deference in the class system. And to think that a Labour Party would defend that place and put people in it is beyond ridiculous. Get, grow up, get a sense of this, and help us get rid of that appalling circus down the corridor. Mr Speaker, last week the Tories royally cocked up and have had to be an embarrassing, hasty retreat. Their next move might now define the rest of their parliamentary term. Except this. You would have to do more than apologise. You have to show contrition. You have to show that you really mean this. This is the task and job for this, this uh, Conservative government just now. They have got to take us back to that point before the bells went last Wednesday. We do not want to reform the standards process. We want it to continue to do its work. But nothing will happen until we get back to this point. 
Stop rewarding donors with places of the House of Lords. This is now all up to them. Show the contrition the public want. Show that you're really sorry and get us back to where we were. Alberta Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's always a pleasure to follow the amusements of the Honourable Member for Perth and North Perthshire, who I'm sure would be delighted to have the title of Lord of Aye. Perthshire. Aye. But, Mr Speaker, I would like to congratulate the Honourable Member for North East Fife for securing this debate. I work with the Honourable Member in the Scottish Affairs Committee, and I have a great deal of respect for her. Mr Speaker, I am one of the longest serving members of Parliament on the Committee on Standards. And probably very few members know that because I very rarely raise any issue in this chamber when it comes to standards matters. But what I do do is I, re- I frequently raise my concerns with the Chairman of the Standards Committee. And the Chairman, who will be speaking very shortly, will no doubt inform this House that I have consistently, regularly, on every opportunity and indeed at every committee meeting, made my deep concerns known about the process by which the Standards Committee operates. And I would like to share with colleagues across the House, as the only lawyer member of that committee until very recently, where the problems lie. There are two principal issues at fault both caused by the House of Commons and its standing orders. One, the Committee on Standards' principal duty, as outlined at Standing Order 149, is to oversee the work of the Parliamentary Commissioner. That's my primary duty as a member of that committee. But along a few pages at Standing Order 150, One of the principal duties of the Commissioner is to advise the Committee. So we have this odd position, Mr Speaker, where the Commissioner of Standards, acting with the utmost integrity, presents her findings to the Committee. We listen to her findings. We then invite members to give their submissions. And then at the end, during the deliberations, we have the Commissioner back in without the MP who has been complained of in the room. And the Commissioner is put in this unenviable, conflicting role because of us. And she attends that committee as the principal adviser to the committee. So there am I, sitting in the committee, having heard her submissions, having then heard the other side, the MP's submissions, only to have the Commissioner back in the room ready and willing to answer wearing that second hat that we have given her. That's putting the Commissioner in an unfair position. And that is where I have long argued there is the potential for a breach of natural justice. Now, let me go further. The Leader of the Opposition said that many of our constituents would be envious if they had or didn't have the process that we have in adjudicating complaints. But let me say this very clearly. The committee that we have is a committee of 14 people, seven excellent lay people, again of the utmost integrity, and seven MPs that I would also like to say are of the utmost integrity. But none of us, me included, have any judicial experience, none. And I cannot think of any private body or any public body that adjudicates or regulates or disciplines its members that has a committee of 14 people. In the real world, where I used to advise as a lawyer, not just now, in the real world, where I used to advise as a lawyer, it is common for the HR process to have a panel of three. And it's so common that this House only last year approved setting up the Independent Experts Panel, where all bullying claims and sexual harassment claims against any of us are not adjudicated by me and my 13 colleagues on the Committee on Standards. They're adjudicated by former High Court judges and others of the highest legal experience 
Guess what? In a panel of three, not a panel of 14, a panel of three. And Sir Stephen Irwin, who set up on our behalf the IEP, has created, as one would expect a judge to create, a very simple set of appeal rules. So members who come before that sub-panel and who feel that they've not been treated in a manner that they think is in accordance with natural justice, if they have a ground, Sir Stephen has set up an appeal to a further body of three, a body that he chairs. Why, Mr Speaker, is it good enough for bullying claims against MPs, sexual harassment claims against MPs, but not claims of paid consultancies against MPs? It is inconsistent, Mr Speaker, that we have this split, split system of adjudicating on MPs. And I'll take the honourable member first. Uh, I'm extremely grateful. Uh, is it that novel a concept to be judged by a jury of your peers, or by seven lay people for that matter? Mr Speaker, I tell you what is most certainly not novel. In any normal court of law, whether it's civil or criminal, if you've got two parties, imagine the case, Mr Speaker, if you have two parties, a claimant and a respondent, and at the end of the trial, the judge and the jury invite one of those parties into the room to deliberate with them. That is the system that we currently have, and it's caused by us by allowing this conflicting role, this unenviable role for the commissioner, where she is the investigator, the presenter of the case to the committee, and then comes in wearing a second hat as adviser. It's unfair on her, and we need to change the system. Most, I'm most grateful to my friend who is making a very compelling case and most an excellent article in the Times today. Could my honourable friend let me know whether at any stage in this inquiry he expressed his view to the Chairman of the Committee on Standards that he believed that the procedure being followed in the Committee failed the test of natural justice? And if he did, what was the response of the Chairman? Yes, Mr Speaker, I consistently argue with the Honourable Gentleman across these benches that the system that we currently have must be improved. And I'll go further, Mr Speaker. On one occasion earlier this year, I used a phrase in one of the committee meetings. I said that the way with which we were dealing with this, the process, not the integrity of any of the parties involved, the process was, in my opinion, repugnant to the principles of natural justice. Repugnant to the principles of natural justice. Mr Speaker, I later received a call from the honourable gentleman explaining to me that members of that committee were uncomfortable with the comments that I had made. Well, I want to say again to the House, it is imperative that for the interests of all our constituents... For it's all, 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 a point forward, was it, Mr Grump? Thank you, Mr Speaker. Is it in order for a member of any select committee to make a lengthy public statement about proceedings of that committee which have been con private. conducted entirely in private? I seek your guidance, Mr Speaker. I am listening to him because what I want to do is follow up with the Chair of the Select Committee, who will also, I am quite sure, inform the House of his views of what has gone on. Alberta Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The reason I am saying this, and I understand why the Honourable Men Member has made that comment, is that I have tried my very best over almost two years to consistently raise problems with the process that we have in this system, not with any individual case, with the process that we have, and it is the process that needs to change. I would like to move on to that, because other members want to speak. Mr Speaker, I believe that there is an important role for the Committee on Standards, in particular with its lay people. I think the Committee on Standards ought to be a committee that drafts and amends the Code of Conduct and the associated rules. I do not think that the, co the Committee on Standards is the appropriate body for me or my 13 colleagues to adjudicate on members whom have had a complaint brought against them. But I would go further. I think the Commissioner needs to be empowered. The rules need to be clarified. The Commissioner should have the same role as she does with the IEP. 
which is that she investigates and she presents her case to the IEP. She does not, importantly, advise the judges on that panel. And so, thirdly, we need to amalgamate the IEP and bring in more former High Court judges to help us in this process to ensure that members of the highest governing body of the United Kingdom, this the House of Commons, are disciplined by people that have the requisite judicial experience when it comes to regulatory and disciplinary matters. I'll give way, yes. Well, to the Honourable Member for giving way, and I very much welcome his support for the independent complaints and grievance uh, procedures. Does he now think, with the benefit of hindsight, he was wrong to vote against them? Mr Speaker, I want this process to move forward. I've got a great deal of respect for the Honourable Member as well. We've worked on a cross-party basis on a number of things. I'm trying to give the House the benefit of my experience. I'm the only lawyer on that committee until recently. And if members want to do a disservice to their own constituents by not having a system that is adjudicated upon by the best people in our land, I think they're not just doing themselves ill service, but they are doing indeed their constituents ill service. Mr Speaker, I want to wrap up because, as I've said, there are many members that want to speak in this process. I'll say once again that the lay people on the Committee on Standards, the Commissioner, are people of the utmost integrity. But being of the utmost integrity does not mean that they are suitable for adjudicating on disciplinary matters affecting members of the House of Commons. So, Mr Speaker, I invite you to assist this House in coming together and moving towards the process that we rightly adopted for the IEP, amalgamating that, having a panel of very senior people with judicial experience. So never again can we have a situation that we did last week where a member felt that he did not receive the proper, the proper system that he felt he ought to have been entitled to. I stand by the comments I made in the report. My name was on that report. But I look forward to coming back to this House with a draft of amended Code of Conduct and a new process. And I look forward to hearing finally the Chairman of the Standards of Committee confirm to this House that he and I have almost at every committee meeting listened to my concerns about process. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am now going to come to the Chair of the Committee, Chair of Standards, Chris Bryant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And first of all, I want to congratulate the uh, honourable member for North East Fife for on securing this debate. Uh, secondly, I want to thank all the members of the Standards Committee. As you can tell, or as the House can tell, that we don't always agree on everything in the Standards Committee. Um, and uh, the honourable member is absolutely right. Uh, he has quite often raised process issues. Um, I think he would also confirm that quite often the legal advice that is provided to the committee by the House has disagreed with him very, very strongly. Um, and um, there are very, very legitimate, if I might, there are very legitimate issues that we do have to address. That is why we are engaged in a code of conduct review. Um, and I take the points that he makes very seriously. I've, I've, I've spoken to him many times on the phone, as he's already referred to. Um, he, he was sounding a bit angrier in the debate just now than I think he really means towards me. Um, but uh, I am grateful to everybody on the committee. Let me start with a very simple point. Um, I don't think we do ourselves any favours if we say that voters don't care about standards in public life. Yeah. I don't know whether they do or they don't. Um, I suspect they do, actually, but I don't know for certain, and the opinion polls vary on this. Um, after all, I think that we've always prided ourselves as a country on not being corrupt, unlike some other countries in the world. But that isn't really the point. Um, the question isn't whether Mrs Jones at number 32 cares about standards in Parliament. It's about whether we care about standards in public life and in Parliament. Um, every time we say that this doesn't really matter or that voters don't care about it, we give another excuse for bad behaviour. Um, and, and, and I might also say um, that those of us who are MPs at any one time only hold our place here on trust. Um, we have a duty not just to our constituents, 
but to the nation, sorry, this is going to sound a bit pious now, but I think it's true nonetheless, we have a duty not just to our constituents, but to the nation, not just to this generation of voters, but to future generations of voters to protect the reputation of Parliament rather than undermine it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Parliamentary democracy based on universal suffrage hasn't actually been around all that long. It's not even managed to have a hundred years yet. Um, it's a precious thing and we do need to defend it, Mr Speaker. And the second point I'd make is that I think independence is absolutely central to any standard system for the House. Anyone involved in a disciplinary process, either as a defendant or a complainant, we need to remember that quite often there are complainants, many of whom are victims, um, need to be completely assured that those involved in adjudicating the matter will always approach the decision with a fair and open mind, without fear or favour. And that's what all 14 members of the Standards Committee seek to do. That is why it is a breach of the code for any member of the House to seek to lobby a member of the Standards Committee. We must be allowed to do our work without any interference. Sadly, Mr Speaker, I've told you this before, but I have to say that over the last 12 months, I have been lobbied repeatedly by a significant number of members about their own or other members' cases. Yeah, right. I have always sought to be polite with members, but extremely robust in response. I apologise, I apologise if I have seemed rude, but this is a very important part of maintaining the independence of the House yeah. and of the system. This also applies to whips. Some of my best friends are whips. <laughs> I get the confession in early. Um, but I would very gently urge whips to exercise a self-denying ordinance when it comes to standards committee reports. As has always been the case in every single instance in the past. Of course, there are matters on which the government has an understandable interest, um, matters of policy and finance, um, but it is inappropriate for anyone to whip House disciplinary matters. By definition, that turns us into a political decision rather than a, a quasi judicial decision. Government should serve the House in standards matters, not the other way round. Yeah, yeah. Um, the independence of the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards is also vital. She has to be able to get on with her work without being repeatedly attacked, briefed against, lied about, shouted at, bullied, threatened or generally undermined. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm quoting a former government chief whip when I say that the recent campaign against her has been very unedifying. Yeah, yeah. It's been worse than that. It has been cowardly and unfair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I honestly think that the Minister should not just have apologised for last week, he should also have apologised to the Parliamentary yeah, Commissioner yeah. for Standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the right gentlemanly thing to do. So, Mr Speaker, can I just, on behalf, I think, of the whole House, apologise to the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards yeah, yeah. for what she has been put through yeah, in recent yeah, days? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want to address the question of due process and ensuring that there is a fair hearing. Um, it is an important distinction that we in the Standards Committee are not a court of law. Indeed, there would be dangers if we were to become a court of law, that we would all have to be legally represented, and that might lead to a process that benefited the wealthy who could afford lawyers over those who can't afford lawyers. We are a select committee of the House. And sometimes, of course, we're dealing with matters which are really rather minor and you wouldn't uh, it, want to bo bother a, a judge with, like the use of parliamentary stationery and things like that. But I just want to make it absolutely clear, um, as Speaker's Council did repeatedly as we went through both this investigation and every other investigation since I've been chair of the committee, which is that we have bent over backwards to make sure that any member gets a fair hearing. Due notice of the charges has always been ensured. A full opportunity to put one's case in writing and or in person. Um, a chance to make arguments in defence or in mitigation. Um, the right to appeal the Commissioner's findings to the committee. There is a right of appeal. It's an appeal to the committee. Absolutely. And every single lawyer that I've seen comment on our process who's read the report has said that it was an entirely fair one. 
Um, and of course, we've taken legal advice throughout. Let me just quote from one. Uh, well, I will give way, but, but if, if I'm, just before I give way to him, I know he, he made a speech last week, and he's repeated this point today about um, the additional measures that are available in the standing orders to us. He should understand that those panels are only there where there are disputed facts. In this case, there were no disputed facts. No disputed facts at all. So the point I suspect he's about to make is completely otios. First of all, I, I would refer the honourable gentleman to the uh, appendix two, uh, set out by for, before the committee uh, by Mr. Patterson. But could I just make this point very simply? When the uh, committee in 2003, which was composed only of three Conservatives, six Labour, and two Liberal Democrats, decided on the investigatory panel. This is what was said. The proposal for an in investigatory panel, which is for serious contested cases, which this clearly is, is expected to arise only infrequently, and it has to meet the following criteria. Proof of the complaint will be likely to lead to the imposition of a serious penalty on the member, and there appeared to be significant contested issues of fact which would not be properly be decided unless the member was given the opportunity to call witnesses and or cross-examine witnesses supporting the complaint. The Honourable Gentleman obviously doesn't agree with me on that, but the facts speak for themselves. There is a con seriously contested facts and they are disputed. I'd make two points. Um, the first is, he basically just agreed with me wholeheartedly because the whole point of these panels is that they are only there where there are disputed facts. There were no disputed facts. And the second point where I would wholeheartedly agree with him is that the facts speak for themselves. They certainly did in this case. Mr Patterson at no stage denied um, that he had engaged in the, in the various different meetings with government ministers and with officials. Um, so I'm afraid that his argument falls on both counts. Let me just read, um, Mr Speaker, um, the words of Thomas de la Mare, who's a highly respected lawyer at Blackstone Chambers, who reviewed, um, our, not for the committee, but he reviewed it and he's published this himself. If the decision maker has had the 17 witness statements, read them and rightly found them to be irrelevant, there is no conceivable breach of natural justice in not calling them in. Exactly. <laughs> the idea that this pretty exhaustively conducted two-stage case of inquiry by the Commissioner and then full review by the Committee evinces a broken system or justifies the egregious step of changing the rules mid-game is absurd. Exactly. All in all, the committee decision looks pretty bomb-proof, balanced, fair once you understand how relevance of material works, carefully reasoned and probably carefully lawyered, and the very appeal stroke review of the Commissioner Owen Patterson wanted. Given this, what has happened next is tawdry. <coughs> so what next? Because in the end, the Standards Committee there is, is only, uh, only exists to serve the House and to try and protect the reputation of the House. Um, first of all, we are already reviewing the Code of Conduct. There are perfectly legitimate arguments to be made about how we should change various different elements. We are now regulated by so many different bodies, sometimes it's difficult for honourable members and right honourable members to understand exactly what the rules are that affect them. I hate the idea that an honourable or right honourable member will be tripped up by a rule that they simply didn't understand through some inadvertent action. Yeah. So I do want to make sure that we have greater clarity in the way that the whole of, the, of our code of conduct and the guide to the rules um, is available to members. Um, I also think that there are perfectly... Um, yes, all right, of course. The Honourable Member speaks with the customary eloquence and he knows how much his, his speech was impactful last week. Are there specific issues that he would like to see improved with this process or does he think the current process as is is fundamentally sound? Well, I think we gave Owen Patterson a very fair hearing. I think it's very difficult, in all honesty, to argue that we didn't. Um, and, and I've racked myself, you know, I've racked my brain as to measures that we might have... I am, however, only chair of the committee, and I want to 
uh, allowed the committee to come to a view on reforms that we might suggest, though I have suggested a few things that I personally um, would like to see in the, in the newspapers in the last few days. Um, but um, the important point is, first of all, we, have, we, we are reviewing the Code of Conduct, as we are required to do in every Parliament. We didn't manage to do it in the 2015 Parliament or the 2017 Parliament, because we kept on having general elections. So it would be great <laughs> if we didn't have a general election for a while, so that we could just finish our, our code. But it's worth saying that we published the terms of reference for our Code of Conduct it, review on the 22nd of September 2020, and we've been engaged in that since then. We took evidence from the Leader of the House earlier on this year. There is an argument for reform of um, some of the... Uh, for, but there is an argument for improvements to some of the process. And as the member for South Leicestershire knows, I personally <coughs> favour clarifying what we do about appeal. I think there is an appeal at the moment that the member can make an appeal to the committee on any basis whatsoever. Whereas, obviously, if we were to have, instead of a de facto appeal process, a de jure um, appeal factor, uh, appeal, then you would have to have a set of criteria against which you could appeal. And that might actually restrict members' um, rights of appeal rather than enhance them. So there's a difficulty that we've got to deal with there. There is an issue about whether, people, whether a member should be able to appeal the sanction rather than the findings, and I'm quite happy to listen to what the committee um, eventually decides, and then I'm sure that the House will want to do no, as well. He wasn't here at the beginning. I think the Honourable Member has only recently come in, but, um, but if he's been here, then I'm happy to listen to him. Just been outside the bar, but um, yeah, the Honourable Member is making the point about sanction, and if the work might be helpful, uh, I'm, I'm interested to hear that there is a, a new code of conduct in progress. Would he appreciate, putting this case aside, that there is a world of difference between a sanction of nine days and a sanction of 11 days, for obvious reasons? Therein might be the reason for an appeal because of the changes and the outcomes that could flow from it, which I think have been uh, ably put forward by my friend from South Leicestershire. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not inimical to... to that view, I think there's a perfectly decent argument to say that maybe there should be an appeal on, the, on sanction. The, however, what we try to do in the committee is stand by precedence, because otherwise we're being unfair. We, we list all the mitigating factors, all the aggravating factors in each of our reports, and at the end of that we come to a conclusion based on the precedence that we've met. My suspicion is that any appeal body would do exactly the same. So I'm not sure that it necessarily would change things, but there is an argument for being able to bring such a thing in. <coughs> what I noted that he said was, leaving this case aside, and that's obviously the most important thing for me, that you cannot, in the words of the Leader of the House, conflate one case with change of the system. That, I think, in the end, is the precise polar opposite of justice. Yeah. That is injustice and has brought the House into disrepute. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. I just, I've only got a couple more points to make, Mr Speaker. The first is... No. No, no, no. Well, I like him, so yes, I will. <laughs> well, I, I, I'm very grateful, and the, the Honourable Member, as usual, is speaking with great eloquence on this subject. Can I, can I suggest to him, though, that the reform is a natural, evolving process? Of course it is. No system is perfect. But by and large, I think the system works quite well. So whatever the, whatever the um, right honourable member yeah. is doing, um, can he make sure that it's transparent as far as he is able to, it progresses as speedily as possible? Because what I'm taking away from this debate and from the vote last week is that actually the right thing to do here is to let the committee produce its recommendations and for the House to consider yeah. them in full debate. Well, I'm very grateful for that point, and it's true that I think that the right way for the House to progress on a cross-party basis, with the advice of independent members um, of the public, is for us to complete our job of work, which we will have done, I'm sure, by Christmas, it, it maybe even by the end of this month. I don't want to prejudge what the committee will decide, um, but uh, at, to publish that, and then that will be an opportunity for the whole of the House to consider the matter. We will probably then want to produce a further report, which will be our final report um, on the draft code and its operation. I would just say, incidentally, that this system hasn't been in place very long. 
The mixture of the independent expert panel and the, uh, uh, for, for ICGS cases and the Standards Committee has only been in place, well, you could argue since the 7th of January 2019, where the member for um, uh, Northamptonshire uh, introduced really important changes to the House, which I think were much valued by um, staff and uh, across the House and, and members as well, and by the public. Um, but in fact, the independent expert panel only started its work in January of this year. So the idea that we, we, we suddenly tear it all up and start all over again, I think, it, it, I, if I had one thing I'd say to the House, Mr Speaker, it would be, let's just slow down. Yeah. Yeah. Let's consider this properly in the round, all the different issues together. But we do still need to tidy up what happened last week. Yes. Yes. I, I, I can see lots of honourable members on the other side of the House agreeing with this. And I, I would just very gently say, to the ministerial team here. Um, there is an opportunity tomorrow if we wanted to. We, we have two issues which are outstanding. One is the creation of the committee, which the Honourable Member doesn't want to serve on, um, even though he's meant to be the chair. Um, and I hope he's better from his COVID. Um, I certainly do hope he's better from his COVID. <laughs> <laughs> um, and secondly, um, unfortunately, uh, of course we all accept that Mr Patterson has left the House. He's no longer a member. We can't impose a sanction on him, as you yourself said earlier, Mr Speaker. But, unfortunately, the House took a view on the report last week, which was basically to suspend it in mid-air. So the motion I would suggest would be a very simple one that we could consider tomorrow, and I think it will be in all of our interests, the whole of the House, to get this sorted tomorrow, that notwithstanding the practice of this House relating to questions already decided in the same session, this House, one, rescinds the resolution and order of the 3rd of November 2021 relating to the third report of the Committee on Standards, HC 797, and the appointment of a new Select Committee. Two, approves the third report of the Committee on Standards. Three, notes that Mr Owen Patterson has been disqualified as a member of this House. I think that would actually be in the best interests of the whole of the House, and then we can move forward. Um, one final point, Mr Speaker. We really struggled to create the ICGS and the Independent Expert yes, Panel. The Right Honourable Lady did mag a magnificent piece of work in trying to get cross-party support for all of that. We promised that the standard system would be independent, mm -hmm. that it would be independent, because that was the guarantor to the staff who felt that they'd been bullied or sexually harassed. We cannot do anything that undermines that. Independence, fairness and justice should not just be the bywords of the Standards Committee, but of the whole of the House. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Uh, it's a pleasure to follow the Chair of the Select Committee, and I congratulate the Member for North East Fife for securing this debate. Um, I hope today, as a member of the Select Committee, I can contribute to this discussion with the benefit of both knowing the details of the specific case we discussed last week and the wider issues about the rules that are enforced for MPs. This debate today isn't another case of parliamentarians arguing amongst themselves. This is about the integrity of this House, and it's one of the very reasons the Standards Committee has such an important role to play in ensuring the rules are clear that the processes are fair and that decisions are made in a way that makes sense to those in this House and those that elect us to serve here. And I think it's really important that we recognise that the overwhelming majority of members who serve in this House, on all sides of this House, are hardworking and will do their best to uphold the highest standards. Indeed, members of all parties have fallen foul of the rules so it's important that all parties contribute to these debates. Before discussing how some of the current processes could be improved, and following on from some of the comments made by uh, the Chair of the Select Committee and the Member for uh, South Leicestershire, if I may, I'd like to address a couple of matters raised last week when we debated the amendments and where I couldn't speak, and some of the subsequent commentary that I've seen in the newspapers, because I feel there is some misunderstanding around the work of the committee and how it reached the decisions that it did. And can I say, Mr Speaker, that having spent many years sitting in court as a magistrate and in Crown Court where I listened to appeals, 
rarely does anyone ever agree with a decision, every decision that's made by a member of the judiciary. I try to apply the same approach to my role on the Standards Committee as I do as a judicial office holder, making decisions without fear or favour, affection or ill will, treating everyone the same regardless of their position or party. Firstly, I have read that the decision reached in relation to Mr Patterson lacked legal supervision. Well, I can tell honourable and right honourable members that all through the hearings, and when committee members were discussing the specific case, Speaker's counsel <coughs> was present and gave legal advice on a number of matters, including the application of the human rights legislation. <laughs> Some members have commented that witnesses were called to provide, weren't called to provide testimony. As members will know, 17 witness statements were provided by Mr Patterson. I read them all, as I believe every member of the committee did. And indeed, the committee discussed numerous aspects included within them. However, I don't believe the committee would have gained any additional insight from hearing directly from those witnesses. And I don't believe the committee would have reached a different decision. Would, would the honourable gentleman be kind enough to give way on that point? I will very briefly. Um, I'm sure that the Honourable Member uh, has read the Joint Committee on Privilege regarding the six criteria, the minimum requirements for the maintenance of natural justice in relation, to, for example, to the examination of witnesses. Without that, and without the investigatory panel, does he not agree that it is extremely difficult, if not impossible, to know what the outcome would be until such a panel is heard with a legal assessor and the legal assessor himself deciding as to whether or not the rules of natural justice have been complied with at that point in time. I, I think my right hon. Friend makes a very important point and I'm going to go on and discuss more about uh, natural justice in a moment. So if I, I may, I'll, I'll continue. Um, I might add that in no previous case that I have seen on this committee have witnesses been called to give verbal evidence and so the committee was right to maintain a consistent approach in its process had we not very quickly people would have been saying why are you changing the rules there is also a route for questioning individuals such as witnesses in writing should the committee feel that this is necessary and we have done so recently thirdly i've heard some say that the commissioner is prosecutor judge and jury and i'm afraid that isn't quite the case. The Standards Committee make the final determination on all evidence and only the committee decide on the sanction. The Commissioner makes no decision on a sanction. Should it feel on balance that the Commissioner has not satisfactorily made the case that a member has breached the code, as was the recent case with the member for Uxbridge and South Ryslip, the committee can reject the Commissioner's findings. Mr Speaker, in early 2020, the House charged the Standards Committee with conducting a review of the Codes of Conduct and how the Code should be upheld in terms of sanctions. Without going into details of the Committee's findings, because it's not yet ready to be published, I can tell the House that we've held numerous evidence sessions, including with the Leader of the House, with the Chief Whips from both, both Government and Opposition, and we've received evidence from similar bodies who regulate professions. Plus, we've received evidence from the Committee on Standards in Public Life and senior members of the judiciary. All this is feeding into our report that will be made public later this year. I would, though, like to share one or two of my personal views on a number of issues that have been raised. Having served on the Committee for some time now, I do have concerns that the current set of rules and codes are complicated although I'm afraid not the system that's related to paid advocacy. That, I'm afraid, is very straightforward. And there are a number of different bodies, as the Chair of the Select Committee has just mentioned, that are involved in giving advice and investigating breaches. IPSA make decisions on spending and can take action if you make a claim incorrectly. Independent Expert Panel deals with bullying and harassment. Advice on using the portcullis and letterheads comes from the House authorities. The Registrar gives advice on what can be recorded and what should be recorded. The Standards Committee deals with some of the sanctions, but not others. It's confusing. I'm a member of the Standards Committee, and I get confused. I touched earlier on the role of the Commissioner as the investigator and the advisor. 
And I do think the system would benefit from some changes to separate those roles, with the Commissioner investigating and with legal counsel advising so that we are absolutely certain we're following the right legal roles. I worry that good behaviour and time served in this House sometimes may work against you if you're find to, found to have breached the rules. And I think that's something that we need to look at very carefully. I worry that members are prevented from speaking to anyone about cases raised against them. Indeed, specifically, they are warned not to discuss their cases. Now, there is value in not having a war in the press, but it doesn't stop reporting and it doesn't help to ensure that MPs are given the right support that they may need, particularly when dealing with vexatious claims. And finally, Mr Speaker, I worry that members don't recognise the value that lay members bring to the current Standards Committee. Those seven individuals provide a vital check on the current Standards Committee. The mix of both elected and lay members with no political involvement ensures very robust challenge. The current mix of members bring genuine expertise and I welcome their involvement and input. I do believe there is a need to look at the process of appeals, to check the process has been followed, that a member has had a fair hearing, and that could be achieved within the current standard systems with some small changes to standing orders. I will give way. Mr Speaker, I do thank the Honourable Gentleman for giving way. He's making a most interesting contribution to this debate. His point about the involvement of the laity seems to me, as a former justice piece, to be very, very important. When it comes to the workings of the justices, the fact that the general public see an ordinary person like them involved gives them more faith in the judicial process. However, if we go down the wrong road, where the, the committee he serves on does not protect the reputation of the members, then the faith of the public in those members decreases, the turnout in elections drops because they say it's simply not worth it, and that is bad for democracy. Yeah. 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 The Honourable Member for his point, and I absolutely agree. This is about the integrity of this House and preserving democracy. It is really, really important. Um, to conclude, Mr Speaker, as Members of Parliament, we are expected to uphold the values, the principles and the rules of the Code of Conduct that we all sign up to and that we should all act on in accordance with the public trust placed in us. There will be times when it's right to make changes to the Code and to update the standing orders. We should do this as one House, once we've considered all the options, to ensure that we protect the democracy and the reputation of all that serve in this House. Can I just suggest to the House, there's quite a lot of members who do wish to get in, and we've got an hour and seven minutes. Jess Phillips is going to set the great example. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I shall start with an apology to you. Uh, as I have already mentioned this to you, I have to leave straight after my comments because I am due in Westminster Hall to talk about people spiking drinks, um, which I'm sure is something that uh, concerns the whole House. Uh, and after I say that apology, I am aware that this might uh, sound slightly backward, but I say to my children when they apologise that sorry is just a word and changing your behaviour is the way that you prove that you are sorry. I, don't, I ask my children not to say sorry to me very often, um, although they are called on to do it quite a lot. I wish to see changed behaviour. Um, it was an absolute pleasure, actually, to um, follow the member from Warrington, not uh, a member I've had much interaction with, um, but I can see he's going to be an interesting and independent voice on the issue of standards in this House. Um, and normally he might, um, he might not recognise some of the fanfare that we've had because normally there's only about 10 or 15 people in the debates about how we're going to look at the code of conduct. Um, but this one seems to have piqued considerably more interest. Um, the, I think that there are potentially that there are changes that need to be made. I don't think that the system is perfect by any stretch of the imagination. The interesting thing about the appeal and the, uh, um, the, the honourable members' insistence about the ICGS and how that works is I hope that members are aware that that, that means that both parties can appeal a decision. So if that system were to be in place, and it went in the way of a member on one of these occasions, that does mean that the complainant, who may very well be vexatious, can keep on appealing that. Uh, and so the, 
it's not a perfect system, one that necessarily has uh, the ICGS system, absolutely. Uh, thank you, Mr. I, I, I'm grateful for the honourable lady giving way. The point is that the former members of the judiciary, Sir Stephen Irwin, has created a set of appeal rules that are very clear in outlining when a complainant or an MP can appeal from the sub-panel to his own panel. And they're broadly the same grounds that we might use in judicial review, where the matter has either been dealt with improperly or unlawfully, or it's manifestly unreasonable. So I'm grateful to the Honourable Lady. Um, I thank the, the Honourable Gentleman. I'm, I'm delighted to hear him defending judicial review. I absolutely love a bit of judicial review. I've taken the government to court on a number of occasions. Uh, for example, when you know they sort of stop victims of domestic violence being able to move across councils, uh, I was always always welcome to judicial review, um, and uh, I, I very much welcome the considerable efforts that people here. Um, are now going to go on as they're advocating for themselves to advocate for the kind of people in my constituency who have no legal representation in any of the, uh, whether that's as domestic violence victims in family court, whether that's with their employment tribunals. I'm also interested to hear that members really want us to have employment rights in this place, because I remember when disabled members uh, in this building were saying that it would be against the Equality Act for them to come in during COVID. Uh, we were told the Equality Act doesn't apply to us because we are not employees. So it's an interesting turn of events that we've been having uh, in, the, in the last few days. Um, and, and what I would... I, I, I deeply care about the standards in this building, not because I'm actually that interested in standing orders to some of the honourable gentlemen uh, here. I know that they, they love them. Um, but I, I, I'm not all that bothered by the bogging down of the numbers and this and that. I am interested in politics mattering to people in this country and for them feeling like they can change it. And if I could thank the ministers on the Treasury benches for anything, the people in our country felt this week like they could change something they didn't like when the government had to undo its deeply unpopular decision. But the more we degrade this place, and for some of us, that is considerably more dangerous than it is for others. For some of us, it every day screams in our faces that democracy has been undermined. It is dangerous if we don't get the standards in this place right and that we don't do it together, collegiately, in the proper process, which has, up until last week, largely been my experience. And it is a shame that this, on this occasion, that was not the case. I, I do have to go and talk about um, other things uh, in another part of this house, but I am just going to uh, finish by saying, in the one rule for... Uh, the people outside this building and different rules for the people inside this building. It has been phenomenal for me this week to see the different contracts that organisations like Randox um, have been given without a tender process. And I speak as somebody who spent hours and hours of my time working in charities filling in tender process up as a tender process for the kinds of amounts of money like £25,000 for a children's sexual exploitation service that would last for a whole year and I had to put what sort of locks were going to be on the doors in the office and where we would keep in, in what would, how we would lock the filing cabinets and hour by hour home office contracts that I have worked on where literally the staffing hour is given out in 15 minute blocks and I monitored on that it is accounted for and I find that what I needed yeah. was hundreds of thousands of pounds to pay somebody in here 
to make that a little bit simpler. And we can blame COVID all we like, but I sat and filled in the government paperwork for grants for organisations that were offering refuge accommodation during the COVID-19 pandemic. And there were pages and pages where they had to reply to multiple different organisations, multiple different departments. And I helped lots of charities do it, and I didn't charge anyone a single bean. And so, I will finish on saying there is one rule for the people in our country and there's seemingly another rule for enormous, friendly companies who are willing to pay the people in here. Honourable Lady, on securing this debate, and very much welcome it. Uh, I too am a member of the Standards Committee, and uh, usually, by precedent, we uh, do not comment on the cases that we put out. We put everything into our report and allow the report to speak for itself. But last week left us in slightly unusual circumstances where we felt the need um, to, to try and clarify some things around our work, our, protest, our processes, and our motivations. I have served on the committee since February of last year. Usually it is senior members of the House that, uh, that serve on the committee, but I've had the great privilege to do so. And with respect to the chairman of the committee, it is in many ways a horrible committee to sit on because there is a huge amount of work to do and very little links back to your constituency. You sit in judgment on colleagues, some of whom you have tremendous respect for, and I joined the committee at a time in which there was great change within the processes around ICGS and around the new things that we were creating, but also questions around the rules that we were upholding, around oversight of the Commissioner and around the processes that we were trying to apply as a committee. Yet I joined up willingly because perhaps the greatest threat to our democracy is when people outside of this building point to all of us and say they are all the same. They are all on the tape. Now, it is true that anyone in this House can make a mistake, but the vast majority of colleagues on all sides of this House are desperate to stay within the rules and are well-intentioned. But for those who do break the rules, the punishment must be fitting. I had no problem voting for the report that was discussed last week. I would do the same again today. And I have only three points that I wish to place on the record. The first is around process. Many honourable and right honourable members have said the process of standards cases needs improving. I agree. I think every member of the Standards Committee would say they agree. They would probably disagree over which parts of the process should be improved, but nevertheless, there is a commitment amongst all, all members of that committee to try and improve the process and to be as good as possible. And what I would say to the House is that since the, the process under which we currently operate was agreed before I became a member of this House, and the committee has been set the homework of trying to uphold the process that exists and make a success of it at the moment. If the assignment is to now come up with a different and improved process, I am sure we will undertake that as happily as possible. I do, however, caution that I think Mr Patterson would have been found to have broken the rules under any process that we create, and we should not kid ourselves on that yeah, front. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I appreciate that he has many friends in this House and the tragic events that have impacted him and his family rightly deserve all of our sympathies. But that is a separate point to his conduct. Equally, I would caution some colleagues around their desire to rush towards a pseudo-legal adversarial process to replace the current yeah. system. Yeah. Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. I think that path will lead to more antagonistic cases a greater role, as the Chairman of the Select Committee set out, for external counsel, which I fear will create inequality amongst members and those who have particular private wealth, and will potentially create a significant loss of parliamentary privilege. Secondly, it has been suggested by some senior colleagues on the backbenchers on this side 
that, as I have only been here for two years, as has the member for Warrington South, that we don't know how this place really works. I say with the greatest of respect to those colleagues that I think that two years here is more than enough to know the difference between right and wrong. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Well said. Yeah. Many senior colleagues have made comments and suggestions regarding the committee's work. If any of those colleagues wish to replace me on the committee tomorrow, I will happily step down. Third, I wish to strongly defend the lay members of the Standards Committee. I know that very few members have interacted with them or had the experience of sitting on a committee with lay members. Those I have served with on the Standards Committee are conscientious, hard-working and fair. I have learnt a tremendous amount from them, and I hope that they would say the same in return. I will give way. I'm very grateful for him giving way, and I've been a member of the House for 20 years. And can I say that the maturity and the balance of the speech that he's given uh, uh, makes me want to intervene on him to thank him for serving as a member of the committee, because I can certainly say it's something I've never been willing to do as a member of the House. And I thank him and the chair and the other members of the committee for the service that they give to this house. Yeah. 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 Welcome that, but we do need to push on. <laughs> Intervention killed a career, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> <laughs> it is the untold story of last week's situation that absolutely none of the points raised by Mr. Patterson and his various supporters were not discussed by the committee at length. The report that was produced contained many of the responses and corrections. Everyone is entitled to disagree with what the committee decided, but I think it is desperately unfair to, su to suggest that the committee did anything <coughs> other than forensically examine all of the evidence presented to them and reach the appropriate decision. The committee so often has diverse starting points, but we work incredibly hard to reach a consensus, which I think is the very de definition of fairness for members whose cases appear in front of us. And if we change the process to remove these lay members, I think our standard system will be all the poorer for their loss. It was only a matter of weeks ago that this House was united in grief for the loss of a great colleague. That was us at our very best. Today's debate, the mistakes that have been made, the opportunism of some of the opposition members, and I hate to point it out, and the rush to create a new system without full consideration is us at our very worst. I am a proud member of the 2019 intake that came to this House determined to deliver a better politics for my constituents. I want a free and fair standards process that allows me to look my constituents in the eye and say, no, we are not all the same. Improvements can be, can be made. But rushing through risks creating a bigger mess. Let cooler heads prevail. Our duties as members of this House are wide-ranging. We represent our constituents, we create laws, we hold the government to account, and we work to further many issues. But we are also role models, held to a high standard. When we fall short of those standards, as any member can do, we should remember our duties to this House, to our colleagues, and to our democratic system. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I wish to thank the Honourable Member for North East Fife for securing the debate today. It saddens me that we find ourselves here today having to debate the consequences of the decision that the majority on the government benches took last week when it came to the former member for North Shropshire. Such a debate should be unnecessary. But sadly, due to the actions of last week, the consequences beyond this place, Mr Speaker, are very clear. Further erosion of public trust in our politics and its representatives. A real anger that it's one rule for the hard-working majority and another for politicians. And a growing sense of apathy that weakens our democracy, our institutions and makes us all poorer. I have since wondered what my own constituents would think, indeed do think, because many have contacted me, those facing fire and rehire,
those struggling to men's, make ends meet on universal credit, and those waiting for, on access to decent social care. The adage that yesterday's news will be today's chip paper will not bear true. And with this Prime Minister, so long as he remains in place, I fear we will return to this dark place again and again. The substantial majority on the government benches, uh, sorry, the substantial majority that the government won at the last general election does not make them beyond reproach. It does not make the Prime Minister beyond reproach. And it does not make any honourable or right honourable member in this place beyond reproach. The younger, newer intake opposites probably understand this. Like me, they probably thought they had entered a 1990s time warp last week. But when it came to the crunch, the old boys' network reigned supreme. Frankly, I'm fed up with this place lurching from one scandal to another. So too are my constituents who expect better. Now is the time to draw a line in the sand. And in my opinion, there are two things we should prioritise, along with those outlined by the Right Honourable Member, the Leader of the Opposition. First, to making corruption in public office a criminal offence, which applies to any MP that falls short of the standards that are expected of them. And secondly, banning any MP from having a second job unless such is required to main professional accreditations. Because, Mr Speaker, from where I come from and for the people I represent, an MP's salary is more than enough to live on. And quite frankly, it is a full-time job if you are doing it properly. It's not enough for the privileged class of MPs, such as the likes of the former MP for North Shropshire, or indeed anyone on any of the benches, and particularly the government benches, and I'd like to quote Lord Tebbis. If this is not enough for you, get on your bike, find another job, leave, because no one is forcing you to stay. And if we don't all act, all I fear is public hostil hostility towards all members in this place will only get worse. And after all, it only takes a few rotten apples to spoil the whole barrel. And in the public's eyes, Everyone in this place is in the barrel. Thank you. Mark Harper. Thank you very much, um, Mr Speaker. And, and can I um, commend you for your statement that you made um, before this debate started? I agreed with every word. And also to the Honourable Lady, the Member for North, North East Fife, for securing the debate. Um, usually, Mr Speaker, I start by saying it's a great pleasure to speak in this debate. On this occasion, it isn't really. Um, I regret that we're here today. Uh, and I think that's most unfortunate. Um, let me say just a brief word about the specific case of Mr Owen Patterson. I read the Standards Committee report in full. I listened to the chairman of the committee last week. I think the report was clear and unambiguous, and I fully support what he said. I hope that the Treasury bench can resolve the matter in the way that he set out tomorrow. I think that would be helpful both for the reputation of the House, but I think also for Mr Patterson, to put this matter to bed rather than it remaining an issue of continuing uh, controversy. I also note in the press discussion uh, a speculation about a peerage for Mr Patterson. I hope ministers can rule that out. I think that would be a mistake and most regrettable. On the process, can I commend the members of the committee that have spoken? I thought they spoke very well. And also, Mr Speaker, a lay member of the committee, I think Tammy Banks, did an interview at the weekend in some detail, which I think, if it was listened to by members of the public, would have reassured them that there is a robust and independent process uh, to hold members of this House to a high standard. And I thank both the Commissioner, the committee, both the members of the House who are members of the committee, but also the lay members for the work they do, generally unthanked and unappreciated, but that I think is uh, very important. Personally, Mr Speaker, I think the process that the committee follows is pretty fair. I'm sure there are improvements. I look forward to the committee's uh, investigation into the, the Code of Conduct and any suggestions that it may have, and I hope they can be taken forward uh, in a cross-party way. 
Um, Mr Speaker, as a former Government Chief Whip, I may be permitted, I hope, a, a couple of points about whipping. Um, this, the decision we took last week was on a House matter, and in my view, House business should be not whipped, and it should be a free vote. I made that position clear uh, privately, and it's the way I conducted myself in the vote last week, so I voted against the amendment because I thought it was important to uphold the standards of this House uh, for everybody in it. The second thing I'd say um, on whipping is that politics, Mr Speaker, is a team game. It's essential to work with your colleagues to deliver anything. But if the team captain is to expect the loyalty and backbenchers and ministers to listen to the direction of the team captain, they deserve that decisions are well thought through and soundly based. Uh, and if in, on occasion, as on this occasion, and I think the um, Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster set that out very well, uh, the Minister of the Cabinet Office set it out very well, and he was a very valued member of my Whip's office, um, and he did apologise on behalf of the government. But if the team captain gets it wrong, then I think he should come and apologise to the public and to this House that's the right thing to do uh, in terms of de de demonstrating leadership. Uh, Mr Speaker, my final point is, is this. It's really important uh, that when this House debates standards in public life, we all remember, every member, that we're judged on what decisions we make. And I was elected in 2005, and I was therefore in this House when we had to live through the expense scandal, which... Uh, enveloped members on both sides. It's the, uh, despite the fact, Mr Speaker, that I uh, never got caught up in that, I had a completely clean bill of health. It's the only time in my 16 years as a Member of Parliament that when I was at a social function and someone asked me what I did, it's the only time I have been ashamed to say I was a Member of Parliament. I am not going to do anything or allow anyone to do anything that takes us back to those dark times and I will do everything I can to avoid us getting there and no one is going to stop me conducting myself in a way that keeps us free of, of that damaging reputational uh, era. We've got to have high standards, improve them and that, Mr Speaker, I think is what every member of the House wants to achieve. Mr Speaker, um, I've only been a member of this House for six and a half years. First of all, I should congratulate the Honourable Member for North East, North East Fife for securing this important debate. But I've only been a member here for six and a half years. I don't have an inbuilt affection for this place or its traditions or anything really to do with it. But I do have an inbuilt sense of justice, fairness and an inbuilt sense of how things should be done correctly. I think it was an appalling day in the House last week and unfortunately I was acting Chief Whip for my party and had to handle what was happening with the old boys network in this place and try to think on my feet. I don't think I acquitted myself terribly well, oh, and I don't it. want to go on about everything that has been already mentioned in here. But I have to say that one of my children was present in this house when the expenses scandal was on, and I never thought I'd be standing speaking here in any case, but certainly not about what I think is corruption Old Boys Network and Double Dealing, I find this appalling. What I've found even more appalling since last Wednesday is the attack on the Commissioner for Standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely egregious. Now, egregious was the word used in terms of Owen Patterson, the former MP in this place, because of what he did. And it brings to mind, it is almost... I can't explain... It, it, it absolutely pains me that I am seen as a member of this place where people think it's right to run roughshod over the rules, 
to take part in bringing this place into dispute and then have their government say, right, everybody on our benches, vote for a new commission that we'll make up and we'll run it. This is not how any parliament should be run. And I see the leader in his place, and I find the leader to be a polite, affable gentleman in cases, but I think he's squirming in his place today. He brought forward the motion last week, and he should be standing answering questions on why he did that and why it was in such ridiculous terms. Mr Speaker, I said at the start I've only been here six and a half years. I don't want to be here much longer. I want to move to an independent Scotland. This kind of behaviour isn't allowed in the Scottish Parliament. I do not want people. I do not want people in Scotland to think that because I am a member of this Parliament, that I would back. No, no. To be fair, it's not allowed here. Are you? No. Thank you. I, I hear the. the, the I think it's, it's clearly been quite a, a, a comment that my honourable friend has made, but um, would she agree with me that it would actually move many things a great deal forward if this place was to come more into line with the Scottish Parliament, where in fact this sort of behaviour is indeed a criminal offence? Yeah. Yeah. Of, of course I'm going to agree with the honourable member for Midlothian. Yes, it is, and it really is. Now, it's the, honourable, the right honourable member, the chair of the Committee on Standards, has quite rightly pointed out it's not allowed here. But what wouldn't be allowed and what wouldn't happen in an independent Scotland is the kind of shenanigans, the kind of shenanigans that took place to protect one of their own, to increase the old boys' network and to have sent a junior minister to, to defend what the government did last week. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady opposite, and I congratulate the Honourable Member for North East Fife for securing this debate. I think it's been a necessary corrective to what happened last week. Mr Speaker, I'd like today to talk about friendship, which is such a key part of this place. We spend so much time together here, and it would be intolerable if everything was about politics. Our friendships are vital for mutual support, for relaxation, to remind us what truly matters in life. And while we refer to those on our own sides of the Chamber as our honourable friends, there are, of course, many friendships forged across the Chamber, and I'll come back to that later. Loyalty to one's friends in times of great difficulty is, I think, amongst the most admirable of traits. But I fear it was an overzealous application of that principle that helped lead this House to the extremely unfortunate decision it took last Wednesday. Mr Patterson's friends understandably wished to stand by him, to protect him, and especially given the tragedy that has struck his, fam struck his family. And of course, all our sympathies are still with him. But as he's no longer in this place, I don't wish to dwell too long on the findings of the Committee of Standards report. But I do share the hope that the Chair expressed that we will get our say on that report. I studied it carefully, both its conclusions and the source material, particularly Mr Patterson's emails contained within it. And in light of the report's contents, and particularly in light of what's happened since last Wednesday, I gently wonder whether Mr Patterson's friends took the wisest course of action when they tried to protect him. I think sometimes friendship means counselling somebody out of a fixed position rather than reinforcing them within it. There is kindness in giving friends advice that they may not want, but they do need to hear. Mr Speaker, I am proud to be part of the 2019 Conservative intake of MPs, often called the 109, and I have made many new and firm friendships within that group since I arrived in this place. There is nothing like a shared experience to bond people together, and I think we have all been through quite the experience in the last two years. I know many of my friends within that group have endured a miserable time since last Wednesday's vote. I know many wish they had chosen to vote differently and are beating themselves up about that. But I say to them that loyalty to one's party is also an admirable trait. This place, indeed our entire political system, could not function without that either. But the reality is that my friends should not have been put in such an invidious position. But 109 has subsequently acquired an additional member, my honourable friend, the member for Hartlepool. And I hope she won't mind me quoting a WhatsApp message she sent to our group, given that it subsequently leaked to the, leaked to the press. She said, This was a colossal misjudgment. It should not have been whipped. You should have been allowed to vote with your conscience on this. I couldn't agree more, and I hope the Treasury bench is listening. Let us return to the convention that House business is not whipped. And may I also prize my honourable friend for her courage in voting against the motion last Wednesday, having only been in this place for six months. 
I'm proud to call her my friend. And I'd also like to praise the two members from 29 intake who spoke earlier, the members from Bolsover and Warrington South, who both sit on the Committee for Standards. They both gave absolutely splendid speeches. They've handled themselves with the utmost dignity and integrity in the face of some totally unacceptable briefings. And I'm proud to call them both my friends as well. Finally, I'd like to thank friends from all sides of the House who took the time to check on me last Wednesday. Breaking the whip is not a straightforward thing to do. It churns you up beforehand and it leaves you a little shell-shocked afterwards. Perhaps next time it will be easier. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was deeply, but Mr Speaker, I was deeply touched by the number of members of friends who simply stopped to ask whether I was all right. And I see some of them here today and many more uh, besides, and members, uh, members and people outside the, this chamber as well. Mr Speaker, friendship, particularly cross-party friendship, is needed more than ever in this place, particularly in light of the terrible murder of our colleague, Sir David Amos. And I recognise that cross-party trust on standards was badly broken last Wednesday, but I hope for all our sakes the damage can be repaired as soon as possible. Mr yeah. Savile Roberts. Yeah, and of course, while the catalyst for today's debate is the former MP for North Shropshire, it's not just about that, is it? It's about the relevance of ethics to how the government conducts the duty of governance. It's about cash for contracts, cash for honours, allegations of bullying by ministers being swept under the carpet, and a former Prime Minister, remember, privately texting ministers to further his own financial interests. Mm. Now, in 2007, the then Member of Parliament for Carmarthen East and Denevor, now leader of Ply Cymru, Adam Price, he tabled a private member's bill to make lying in politics illegal by making it an offence knowingly to mislead the public. His proposal was made as an attempt to restore faith of what was then an age right on the cusp of fake news, fake views and fake figures. We manipulate the truth at our peril, and now more than ever those kind of radical ideas are needed. Conservative MPs made much last week of the argument that MPs should be treated like other employees. Well, I would put it to them, if a doctor willfully misleads a patient, if a company willfully misleads their customers, or if a teacher willfully misleads a pupil, there are consequences yep. enshrined in law. Yet showing blatant dis disrespect to Parliament, and more importantly to our constituents, a minister can break the ministerial code, can give contracts worth billions of pounds to friends and mislead this House without consequences. Faith in Westminster politics is at an all-time low, thanks to this Government. Major reforms are needed to regain trust. We need independent oversight of the Ministerial Code, ban MPs from having second jobs, except for public service, which we are paid to do, force Ministers to correct the, the, the record after giving misleading information in the Chamber, scrap the House of Lords and replace it with an elected upper chamber. And in the meantime, Adam Price and I are also writing to the Metropolitan Police asking them to conduct an investigation to determine whether offences have been committed by the Conservative Party uh, under the Honours Prevention of Abuses Act of 1925. But, and I close here now, if the system cannot be reformed to stop corruption, perhaps the system is itself the problem. The Honourable Member for the Ronda spoke very well and very fluently and very capably about the process. But at the end of a debate like this, we do tend to get drawn into a conversation amongst ourselves, and we forget how this appears to people outside. I will tell you, the people of Wales are seeing their representation here being reduced from 40 to 32 members. They see a government with a robust majority being able to ride roughshod over perfectly normal, accepted ethical standards. And the people of Wales will be asking whether this is the system that serves them best or whether the people of Wales could do it better themselves. Oh, yes. A point of order, Kevin Brown. Thank you, Mr Speaker. On a point of order, um, a further to what the former Government Chief Whip said earlier, the Member for Forest at Dean, right on Member Forest Dean, I understand the Prime Minister arrived back in London at 5pm this evening at King's Cross. Would it be in order for him, following what the Honourable right on Member said, for him to come to the House, either before the end of the debate or, if that's not possible, to make a statement to the House in order to personally uh, apologise in the way that the former Chief Whip advised he should. To require this, not a point of order. Right, let us continue to.
David, uh, the Subaluma, David Jones, whichever one of you next. David. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, um, and it's a pleasure to follow the uh, honourable lady member for Duivod Miriones. Um, the former member for Shropshire, the right honourable Owen Paterson, served his constituency for some 24 years and held some of the highest offices in government. And what has happened to him is, by any standards, a tragedy. He's lost his career, uh, but much worse, uh, he's lost his wife uh, in the most distressing of circumstances. And at a human level, there cannot be a member of this House uh, that does not feel at least some degree of sympathy towards him. Um, I've heard the proposal of uh, the uh, chair of uh, the Standards Committee as to the way forward in terms of dealing with the case of Mr. Patterson. But may I say this? Uh, in reality, the specific issue of uh, Mr. Patterson's personal conduct is now closed as a consequence of his resignation last week. However, his case has highlighted issues that deserve the continued attention of this House. In retrospect, everyone agrees that it was wrong of the government to conflate the specific issue of Owen Paterson's conduct with the important wider issue of the regulation and enforcement of standards uh, in this House. Uh, and I was glad to see the Chancellor for the Duchy of Lancaster issuing uh, what I thought was a very full apology for that. But what the case has thrown into focus are questions of natural justice that are not adequately addressed in Standing Orders 149 and 150. Uh, Mr Patterson, for example, wanted to call no fewer than 17 witnesses to give evidence in support of his case, and he was not afforded the opportunity to do so. Uh, the Honourable Member for South uh, Leicestershire has expressed his concerns on the issue of natural justice, uh, and for my own part, I find it hard to see how the denial of a right to call witnesses and for those witnesses to be examined and cross-examined, a right which is taken for granted in civil and criminal proceedings in this country, can be compatible with natural justice. Yes, I'll, I'll certainly have that. We did hear the witnesses in writing. Their witness statements are all available online. We considered the matter, as happens in every single court in the land, we considered the matter as judges would and, and as many tribunals would. And I would just say to him, he voted for a motion which I'm afraid did not close the matter on Mr Patterson. It left it completely and utterly open, deliberately so, and indeed Mr Patterson still asserts that he's innocent and if he were a member he would do the whole thing all over again. So I'm afraid we will have to tidy this up. I, I hear what the, the, the chairman of the, uh, of the committee has to say. Uh, but frankly, it's one thing to, hear, to, to read written evidence. It's another thing for that evidence to be tested in examination and cross-examination, and that was not allowed. Uh, furthermore, there is no provision for an independent appeals process under Standing Order 150. I don't believe that that can be right either. Uh, provision uh, should be made for a proper appeals procedure under the Standing Order 150 process as indeed there is under the Independent Complaints and Grievance Scheme, where an appeal panel is chaired by a High Court judge. And there should also be greater legal input into the entire process. Section, uh, Standing Order 150 does provide for the establishment of an investigatory panel with a legally qualified assessor and counsel, but only at the <coughs> behest of either the Commissioner herself or the Committee. And that, of course, was not done in Mr. Patterson's case. And indeed, ever since the procedure was first put in place, no such panel has ever been established, which is a matter of regret, because the legal assessor has a duty under Standing Order 150.10 to report to the committee his opinion as to the extent to which its proceedings have been consistent with the principles of natural justice. And, Mr Speaker, that is the only occasion in which the words natural justice appear anywhere in Standing Orders 149 and 150. And that, I suggest, is also a matter that needs to be rectified. Uh, in the debate last week, the Right Honourable Member for Orkney and Shetland, who I'm delighted to see in his place today, uh, made the important point that while he was sympathetic to the proposition that the rules do need reform, 
This could only be done with consensus. And I believe that Mr. Patterson's case, despite its wholly regrettable outcome and, frankly, the way it was handled last week, has highlighted deficiencies in the process that do need to be addressed by the House. And I very much hope that now that the sting caused by the conflation of the individual case with the wider issue for need for reform has been removed, the House can proceed on the basis of consensus and seek to make improvements to a system which, whatever the rights and wrongs of the Patterson case, is so clearly in need of reform. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I'd like to begin by congratulating the member for North East Fife for securing this very important debate. But, Mr Speaker, never in my short time in Parliament have I witnessed such naked corruption as I did last week in the botched attempt by the Tories to save their mate from being held to account for his serious misconduct. And that the Prime Minister hasn't even showed up today shows once again that he thinks he can duck the consequences of his actions, particularly as we've just found out he's sitting down the road having a cuppa. He's making an absolute mockery of his office and our democracy. Three members of the opposite bench who are currently under investigation by the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards voted in favour of ripping up the rules. And we've heard reports that the Prime Minister threatened his MPs with losing funding for their constituencies if they did not back his plans on Wednesday. Blackmail to cover up corruption. What an utter disgrace. Call it what it is, the government's attempt to rewrite the rules was unashamedly corrupt, that it was done in an attempt to cover up the kind of corruption that we've seen throughout this pandemic. And it tells us everything we need to know about the depth of contempt the Tories have for the constituents and country they are supposed to serve. The member in question was found guilty of breaking cash for access rules after he received £100,000 from two firms, who then went on to win hundreds of millions of pounds worth of code of contracts, despite evidence they were not up for the job. How many more crony contracts has this government allocated? Over the last year, we have seen the previous Health Secretary agreeing a COVID test contract to his pub landlord via WhatsApp. We have seen revelations that a fifth of UK COVID contracts raised red flags for corruption. 27 PPE or testing contracts worth £2.1 billion were paid by the taxpayer to firms with connections to the Tory party. Enough is enough. Eye-watering amounts of public money have been funnelled into the pockets of Tory donors and their rich mates under the guise of the pandemic, while our public services have been systematically defunded for over a decade. It's beyond parody that this government is trying to reposition itself as the party of public services when this is the reality. And we need a full and transparent investigation into how these crony contracts were awarded and their outcomes. Not only do the Tories think it's OK for MPs to take on lucrative second jobs, which clearly create conflicts of interest between the constituents they serve and their paymasters and big misters, who buy influence through the back door. No, thank you, I won't give way. I'm going to carry on. They clearly think it's OK to give a green light to cash for access, a practice that places the interests of MPs clearly with those of the highest bidder, obliterating their obligations towards those they were elected to serve. And Mr Speaker, so with that in mind, I will ask the Minister to take this opportunity to write here and now to commit to going back to government and appealing to them to make, take action to ban second jobs for MPs unless they need to retain professional recognition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. You're right. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I should start by declaring my interest as a member of the Committee on Standards in Public Life. Uh, and the only other member of this House who's also a member of that committee, the Right Honourable Lady for the Member for Derby South, is not able to speak in this debate. Having spoken to her, I know, though, she would agree with the criticisms I'm about to make. The amendment that was passed last week and which we have been discussing sought to do a number of things which were wholly wrong. It sought to link the determination of an individual case to proposals for reform of our disciplinary system more broadly. 
It sought to establish a committee of the House that did not and would not have cross-party support to consider reforms that could only succeed with cross-party support. And it sought to do all of that by whipping government backbenchers on House business that should not have been whipped at all, mm -hmm. and with some unfair and gratuitous attacks on the competence and integrity of the Parliamentary Commissioner for Standards, who, as you pointed out, Mr Speaker, has no right of reply. For all of these reasons, I could not support that amendment. But it seems to me that this debate should not focus on rehashing last week, but instead consider what we do now. And on that, Mr Speaker, I speak for myself, not for my committee or for any member of it, but it seems to me that for all of the objectives of that amendment which were illegitimate, not all of them were illegitimate. I do think, for example, that it is right to consider a clear and effective appeal mechanism for those initially found to have committed misconduct. But of course, one of the frustrating aspects of last week is that the noise created by the rest of that amendment has made a serious conversation about reform in that respect harder to have. But I also think that the understandable public reaction to the events of last week means that we will have to think more extensively about reform to our disciplinary processes. And perhaps we should do that anyway. And I take... No, no, no. Briefly. No. I, I, I just want to ask my right honourable friend, who was the Attorney General, a simple question, as I put it to the Leader of the Opposition. If this investigative panel could have been set up but was not set up, it was impossible for the rules of natural justice as applied by Standing Order 150 to, to be brought into effect. Does he not accept the fact that that puts the member in question at a very, very severe disadvantage? I, I regret, Mr Speaker, I don't think there's a simple answer to that question, but I will say this to my honourable friend. I'm afraid I disagree with him that the problem here is a breach of the rules of natural justice. I don't think that is our issue. I want to come on, if I may, to what I think the issue is, but I do not think it is that. Uh, I'm afraid that my view is that last week reminded the public that it does not trust this House to discipline its own members. And I say reminded because not only have we been sent that message before, but we have acted on it before. The expenses scandal led to an independent body to determine our expenses claims, and only last year, as others have pointed out, we agreed an independent expert panel to determine claims of bullying and harassment. And I believe we now need to follow through on the logic for independent determination of other forms of serious misconduct. And although I accept as a matter of democratic principle, it is necessary for Members of Parliament to authorise a sanction involving suspension or expulsion from this House. I don't think it follows from that that it's either necessary or desirable for Members of Parliament to judge the merits of disciplinary proceedings against other Members of Parliament. And if we needed a demonstration of how that can cause problems and undermine confidence in our rules, we surely had it last week. And so I think we have to have reform, but reform has to be undertaken with a clear head and in a balanced way. Now, as I said, I think there is a strong case for a clear appeal procedure. Now, I've heard the argument made particularly forcefully and well by the Honourable Member for Rhonda that the Standards Committee's consideration of a case is, in effect, an appeal from the Commissioner. But I have to say, with great respect to him, because I generally do agree with what he says, I don't think that's quite right. An appeal is a means of challenging a decision. The Commissioner makes a recommendation and not a decision. The decision is made by the Standards Committee, and it's that decision that would be subject to any appeal that we added to the current architecture. But again, with great respect to the Honourable Member for Rhonda and indeed to his committee, because I think he and they do a good job. I think we are going to have to face the need for a greater independent element in deciding cases of serious alleged <coughs> misconduct by other members of this House. Now, I don't, to come back to the point my honourable friend for Stone made, I don't entirely go along with the view set out by my honourable friend for South Leicestershire that what we have here is a fundamental breach of the rules of natural justice. That doesn't appear to me to be what is happening. What I think we have instead, however, is a failure to meet the test of public confidence, and that is a different test, but one which we also have to take seriously. 
And as a result of it, and again, I take the Chair of the Standards Committee's point that we are engaged in this process of reform, and I entirely take his point about the pace of such reform. But it seems to me we must expect and establish due process, but we should have these cases largely determined independently of us. And if we don't, I fear confidence in us will continue to fall, with consequences for Parliament and for the acceptance of the laws we pass. And the pandemic has shown us how much that can matter. So I don't think the lesson of last week is to back away from reform of our disciplinary processes, but rather that we have to get on with it and go further in it, but to do so in a wholly different way than we approached it last week. Yeah. Well, Mr Carvajal. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Can I thank you for allowing the application uh, from my hon. Friend from North East Fife for today's debate. It is unfortunately very timely and necessary, and I congratulate my hon. Friend for securing it and, indeed, on the manner in which she introduced it. I listened to you, Mr Speaker, in your statement before the debate, talk about the best traditions of the House, and my mind went back to a conversation I had with a colleague not long after I was elected to this House. And it was basically to the effect that the day anybody found me standing here making a speech about the best traditions of the House, they could take me out and shoot me because my useful life would be over at that point. So the House will appreciate, I hope, that what I'm about to say, I pick my words with extreme caution. I do not think, actually, that the convention of not whipping house business is the best tradition of the house, but I think it is a certainly very, very important one. And I don't know whose decision it was to whip the business in the motion and the amendment last week, but it was a serious, a colossal error of judgment. They have damaged the authority of the Prime Minister, they have damaged the credibility of the Leader of the House and they have seriously undermined the ability of the Government Whip's Office to do the job with which it is charged. Some might say that that is a silver lining, but the fact is that the cloud, which is the damage to Parliament as a whole, is an otherwise impenetrably dark one. But as others have said, we now really need to move on and look at what we do to go ahead. And yes, as others have said, and I take the point from the uh, on, right honourable member for, from Kenilworth, that uh, we need to look at questions of process. I remain to be convinced about the need for an appeal, but given the fact that this is a committee, it's not a court, and that it is not a process that uh, is informed by legal practitioners, then yes, I can see a, the, the argument for there being a fresh pair of eyes uh, on, on these matters. Um, if, however, all we do in the process about which the Leader of the House was speaking last week is to tinker around with a few procedural matters, then, in fact, we might as well not bother, because that simply is not equal to the task that is before us of restoring the public confidence in the ability of this House to deal with its own standards and discipline. I think, in fact, in particular about the question of those members and right honourable members who have outside interests, second incomes. I don't actually favour an outright ban on second jobs. I think that would have the unintended consequence of seeing more people see this as a, 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 an occupation from which there would never be any departure. And I think the idea that people can come here for a term or two and then return to whatever profession or occupation they had beforehand is a good and sensible one. But I have seen, Mr Speaker, reports this weekend about the time given by some honourable and right honourable members and the money that they have received in return. And I think it is simply indefensible. So as we look at what we do in the future, I think that is one of the things that we absolutely have to be considering. It, I think, at the very least, we have to have a cap on these matters. I return, Mr Speaker, to the point that I made in my intervention on the Leader of the Opposition. 
If the government are approaching this as a good faith exercise, then we should be able to hear a commitment from the Treasury bench that not only will there not be any repetition of this business of whipping house business, but in fact, when any, any proposals that, that do emerge are brought forward, they will give us a cast iron guarantee now that they will not be whipped. When you are in a hole, stop digging. The government looked like they have stopped digging, but I still get the sense that somehow they cast rather envious and wistful glances in the direction of the shovel. Before I bring Sir William in, I have to bring in Wendy Chamberlain at four minutes past seven. Sir William Cash. Mr Speaker, uh, I still have not had an answer to the question that I have put at the very beginning, which is at the heart of this. Why did the committee itself not convene which they had the power to do so, which would have required the Commissioner to hold an investigative panel. There is no, no answer is given to this. And it is no good people saying, oh, it doesn't matter. Because the reality is that it is only by having the rules of natural justice applied as set out in that part of the standing orders it is possible to achieve the examination of witnesses and the fairness and criteria of the Joint Committee on, on Privilege. I certainly will. Uh, I'm very grateful to give you away. Um, somebody did give you an answer to, him an answer to that. It was the chair of the select, select committee who said the, the facts were not at dis, in dispute, which is one of the conditions of setting up that committee. Well, it's a very interesting response because it still doesn't answer the question. Because the reality is, no, I have to say with great respect, if you look at what the Appendix 2 stated, there were 17 witness statements on Mr. Patterson's behalf set out in rigorous detail. Now, in the relation to milk and food safety, there was witness evidence from the Chief Vet, the National Milk Laboratory, and the former chair of the Food Standards Agency. These confirm that within the framework of the exemptions for the Member of Parliament's actions in the public interest, his actions, that's the member, former member's actions, made milk safer. As on the question of the contamination of a ham product, Professor Chris Elliott, in unchallenged evidence, made clear that what the former member for North Shropshire revealed was the worst case that that <coughs> professor had seen in 35 years. On both matters, their genuinely expert opinions were not followed in establishing the facts and in justification of the former member's defence. On the question of natural justice and witness statements and evidence, it has been established over and over again in the courts that every court or tribunal is obliged to accept and follow unchallenged witness, ev unchallenged witness evidence. The former no, I, I, well, I haven't time, and I, 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 we need to move on. It is now established that the recent independent complaints and grievance scheme that a judge must, that a judge must be, and now will be, as far as I can judge, embedded in the procedure. An investigatory panel would only be set up infrequently in case of serious contested issues of fact, which would and could not be properly decided unless the member was given the opportunity to call witnesses and or to cross-examining witnesses supporting the complaint. It would therefore t fail the test of natural justice. This is made abundantly clear by the 2003 committee report, which I've already referred to, which was actually set up and had seven, eight, eight members of Lib Dems and Labour and only three Conservatives. So why this committee was never set up is a complete mystery. I hear the member for Rhondda saying that he was a stickler for parliamentary procedure and due process in Parliament. So why did he decline to, inv to, to inv 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 invoke the natural justice provisions, including examination of witnesses under his own standing orders, and furthermore, as it consistent with the Joint Committee on Privilege and the fair tests that were set out? So, not only does every disciplinary committee in the land and other courts of justice and tribunals of every kind have rules of natural justice, not only that, but they have the right to appeal to the courts for judicial review. Mm. Members of Parliament cannot do so because of Article 9 of the Bill of Rights, which includes things such as equality of arms, examination of witnesses and no delay. The reality is that in this instance, this serious contested case, there has been an, a, a failure of natural justice. I don't know, and no nobody will ever know, how, whether the investigatory panel would have discovered because it was never invoked. 
I think it's most regrettable and deep, a deep contribution to this tragedy that the, the centre of gravity of this problem, which is that the rules of natural justice, which are prescribed under the standing orders, was not applied, and I stand by that because it's evident on the face of the facts and the law. We now go to Wendy Chen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank all members for their presence here today and to all who made their contributions. Mr Speaker, I hope the tenor of the debate met your expectations. And let me be clear, my intention in applying for this debate was simply what it says in the motion, to make an initial assessment of the consequences far beyond the case of the former member for North Shropshire. And I was also compelled to act by the comments made in relation to the future of the independent current eh, Standards Commissioner. And I reiterate many of the comments made across the House in support of her. Um, there are obviously a number of things already underway, the review of the Code of Conduct that the Chair of the Standards Committee referred to, but I do feel that the variety of standards and codes that have been raised today in the debate suggest that they need to be aligned and streamlined. And there have been a number of issues raised, such as the work of the committee, the Commissioner, appeals, and then uh, issues outside um, the direct nature of this debate, such as cash for honours, uh, a awarding of contracts, ministerial codes of conduct, all those things need to be looked at. Um, but just in closing then, um, last week's vote did have direct consequences that need to be addressed. And I note the suggestion by the Chair of the Select Committee, which seems to fit the suggestion of both the Honourable Member for North Dorset and the Right Honourable Member for Forest of Dean, and I would agree that we should take them forward. Last week's actions by the Government were a clear executive outreach, and the Prime Minister does have serious questions to answer. The Minister eh, suggested in his remarks that there was regret on the Government side and by ministerial colleagues, so I am disappointed that the Prime Minister is not here, but also when he has had the opportunity to, um, to apologise in comments made yeah, to the press today, he has chosen not to do so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is about trust. It's about trust in the government that it will represent the House and House business and not the government's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's about trust in us as our constituents' representatives. And that trust, once eroded, uh, is very difficult to regain. Trust in our politics has been eroded in this past week. That includes uh, all of us here in this House, and it is on behalf of all our constituents to do all in our power to do our best to rebuild that trust as we take the next steps on standards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I was just going to put the vote, but uh, yes, John Whitting then. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. And I, of course, understand why it was not possible for you to call me in the debate. However, I am left in something of a dilemma, because as I understand it, the House still has passed a motion that establishes a new committee, which I am supposed to chair. I agreed to chair it on the basis that it would be a cross-party committee, which would have support from all sides of the House. It appears that is not possible. Um, and therefore, as the honourable gentleman indicated in his contribution, I would not wish to chair a committee that has, uh, that has support from only one side. But I am not clear what is the status of the committee, given that the House's motion, which was passed last week, as I understand it, is still in place. <laughs> I'm going to have to put the question, but my quick answer will be that we do need to resolve the issue as quickly as possible, because I don't, no committee can go forward. Everyone has accepted that, but we need to draw a line under it, because at the moment there are too many questions that need to be answered. But it's in the government's hands to resolve that, and I'm sure that they will want to do it as quickly as possible, in which case that this House can then begin to move on. The question is that this House considered the matter of consequences of the decision of the House of the 3rd of November relating to standards. As many of that opinion say aye, aye. the contrary no, I think the ayes have it, the ayes have it. Order, order. Helena, all yours. Very kind, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Environment Bill. Consideration of Lord's message. Now. We begin with the Government's motion to insist on its amendments 31A and 31B and disagree with the Lords in their amendment 31C with which